Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here uh, in person or uh, online for those who couldn't make it to this um, conference on biodiversity conservation organized by Allonvi, which is um, an alliance of the French research institutions working on the environment. My name is Yves Siama. Uh, I'm a science journalist. I'm also vice president of the French Association of Science Journalists. And I will be facilitating uh, and moderating these three days of conference. Um, in introduction, we would like to welcome um, Marianne Domezel, who is president of Ex Marseille, vice president uh, for sustainable development of Aix-Marseille University, and uh, François Houllier, who is um, president of Allonvie. And um, I will let them say a few words of welcome before we actually uh, start the scientific part of the conference. So Marianne, would you say a few words? Je vais faire l'intervention en français parce que euh, L'anglais avec l'accent marseillais, ça ne le fait pas trop. Quoi. Donc, euh, <rire> comme je tiens à mon accent marseillais, euh, voilà, je vais faire la, la, une, une brève intervention. Donc, tout d'abord, je tiens à excuser le, le président Eric Berton, euh, qui, euh, suite au changement de salle et au, au changement d'agenda euh, qui mettent finalement Marseille un peu euh, au devant de la scène, euh, n'a pas pu être là. Donc, évidemment, l'Université d'Aix-Marseille est, est ravie de d'accueillir ce colloque à l'envie qui, qui, qui est en marche du Congrès de la Nature. Donc, bonne nouvelle, on, on va regarder Marseille avec un regard positif au niveau international. Simplement vous dire que l'Université d'Aix-Marseille joue quand même un rôle autour de la, de la biodiversité. Alors, je ne vais pas vous donner les grands chiffres de l'université parce que certains les connaissent et, et ce n'est pas l'objet aujourd'hui. Enfin, nous, on les connaît bien. Euh, juste euh, autour de la biodiversité, euh, vous dire qu'on a une trentaine de laboratoires de recherche qui travaillent sur ces questions-là. On a euh, huit, grandes, euh, huit grandes universités, trois in instituts d'établissements qui doivent faire euh, le lien entre la formation et la recherche autour de la biodiversité. Hein. ITEM, IM2B et Océan qui a été créé euh, récemment. Euh, également, euh, euh, un conseil de, du climat euh, qui est présidé par le directeur de l'OSU, de l'Observatoire des sciences de l'Université de Marseille. Et euh, donc, évidemment, dans ce conseil du climat, on, a, euh, on discute aussi de la biodiversité, puisque les membres euh, du conseil du climat, on a aussi des spécialistes de la biodiversité. Récemment, l'université a nommé un chargé de mission euh, biodiversité. On a un groupe de travail. Et l'objectif de ce groupe de travail, alors je ne sais pas combien de temps ça va mettre, mais l'objectif, c'est d'avoir une, une science participative sur les campus pour mettre en avant... Euh, la biodiversité sur nos campus et la richesse de, 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 de nos campus en termes de biodiversité. Évidemment, sur la question de la biodiversité, on travaille avec les étudiants et je voudrais juste vous citer le sentier botanique qu'on euh, qu est en train de lancer sur Saint-Jérôme, qui est porté par une association d'étudiants du, du master bio, bioécologie. Et euh, moi, je suis toujours admirative de la de l'envie de ces étudiants de mettre en valeur leur campus et ce sera un beau sentier. Alors bon, pour le moment, il n'est pas prêt. Le congrès de la nature est, arrive trop tôt. 
Peut-être qu'il aurait fallu le reporter de deux ou trois ans, euh, le Covid 21, 22, 23, 24. Non, je plaisante. <rire> non, c'est bien que ça ait lieu maintenant. Euh, voilà, et puis on a également une trentaine de formations autour de la biodiversité. Je vais arrêter là sur les chiffres. Je vais euh, vous souhaiter un bon colloque. Euh, M'excuser parce que je ne peux pas rester avec vous parce que c'est un peu compliqué de s'inscrire à l'UICN en ce moment. Donc je vais aller euh, voir comment faire pour euh, tenir le stand de l'université. Donc on a un stand. Et si vous voulez passer, ben, je ne me rappelle plus le numéro parce que ça ne fait que changer. Mais on, voilà. Je sais que c'est sur espace euh, climat. Mais après, le numéro, je ne me rappelle plus. Mais vous verrez, on a des beaux, euh, des beaux euh, caquets mono verts. Euh, voilà. Bon colloque. Merci beaucoup, euh, Madame Doumezel. Et je passe le... so now the floor to François Houllier. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon. Um, just a few words. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to, to be here today for this... Uh, Cons uh, conservation uh, conference on biodiversity conservation. Um, as was said, I'm, I'm presently the, the CEO and president of IFREMER, the National Institute, which is uh, fully dedicated to uh, marine science and technology. Um, also, the and this is uh, the reason of my presence today. Uh, I'm also the, the chairperson of Alonvi, which is the, this alliance of uh, research organization, but also of um, the, the conference of uh, university presidents. Uh, Uh, for all the organizations that are interested in uh, environmental sciences. So I, I would first of all extend my warmest thanks to CNRS because this was an initiative by uh, uh, the former uh, director of uh, the Institute uh, Ecology and Evolution, uh, Stéphanie Thiebaud, uh, who had this idea of organizing that conference. Uh, also to Martin Ossert, who is present here today and uh, was, uh, worked a lot on, uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the project. Uh, I, I saw uh, Stéphane Blanc, who is the successor of Stéphanie Thibault. I don't know whether he's still in the room, but uh, yes, he's there. So I would like to uh, really to extend my thanks to CNRS, who took this initiative, to the Foundation for um, uh, Biodiversity Research, LFRB, and also to ex-Marseille University, because uh, you welcome us here in, in Marseille, and I'm very happy to be here today and to come back in, in the next days. Um, and uh, so uh, I think all my colleagues of Alonvi are, are very happy to, uh, that this conference took place. Uh, I would like to, to say a few words about uh, the reason for which uh, this, um, uh, this conference for, was important for Alonvi members. Um, of course, there is this uh, IUCN World Conservation Congress that will take place um, uh, starting uh, day after tomorrow in the evening. Uh, and there will be plenty of uh, presentations and discussions that will take place during uh, that uh, conference, that congress. Um, and for example, my organization, along with the uh, Office Francais de la Biodiversité, we are going to have uh, an event on marine biodiversity on Saturday uh, morning. Uh, I know that other members are going to have also uh, uh, stands or uh, organize events, uh, ex Marseille Université. IRD, and I know that Valérie Verdier, the, the, the president of IRD, is present, and they, are, they have prepared a, a lot of things, a big file of uh, events. Uh, the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle will be also present, and the other organizations that are part of uh, uh, Alonvi, probably. Um, but the thing which is a bit different this afternoon is that we felt that there was a need for a scientific conversation, because the IUCN World Congress will be about science, research, of course, but also about action, about policies, And we felt that there was a definite uh, need for discussing among scientists and across scientists from different countries in this very specific pandemic context, which doesn't help um, that much. So we felt that it was important to somehow have a sort of state of the art in conservation biology uh, about the issues, the concepts, the various biomes also. Um, myself, I'm in charge of ocean. That was not... All my career was not devoted to the ocean and seas, but at uh, this stage, I, I feel that it is important that we speak a bit about b ocean biodiversity as well about, as about agricultural biodiversity or forests or town diversity, city diversity. Um, so we hope at Alonvi that these days will be an opportunity to mobilize all scientific communities that are working on major environmental issues. And the, the aim is to uh, collectively address the, this theme of biodiversity conservation Uh, to identify cross-cutting and multidisciplinary issues, and multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity are very important, 
And, and we hope that um, this, um, uh, this uh, conference uh, will uh, help also involving the various organizations that are members of the Alliance à l'Envie, but also uh, their partners, uh, of course, uh, in the world. Uh, as you know, these days will be organized around four sessions. I will not comment them. Uh, there was one just now about uh, evolution, evolutionary context of biodiversity, uh, conservation strategies. There will be one about the diversity of types of anthropization and their effects on conservation. There will be one that uh, will comment just after about the climate biodiversity interactions and feedbacks. And there will be one also about the ethical issues in biodiversity conservation while the, the, the questions of environmental justice, equity, ecological efficiency, or effectiveness. Um, I will come back to this third session on climate biodiversity interaction, because um, we also felt that uh, such a conference was important to uh, highlight the, the value that ILMV members uh, attribute to uh, sustainability science. This is something that is very dear to Valérie Vertier, uh, sustainability science. And of course, you know that this summer there was this IPCC uh, release uh, about uh, their sixth uh, assessment a report on the physical basis of climate change. So we had a lot of discussions during this summer on the climate uh, crisis and urgency. Maybe not enough, but we had a lot about that. Now, these days, we will shift to biodiversity during a week. Uh, and we will focus on nature conservation, on the biodiversity crisis and urgency, on nature-based or inspired solutions. But I feel there is a sort of risk that we switch and zap from a crisis to another, from one urgency to the other. And so I think that this uh, third session that you will have tomorrow afternoon is important because uh, we should consider these twin crises or these twin urgencies simultaneously and not try to, to look at them independently from each other. This was maybe a, uh, my message. Uh, yeah. Finally, uh, I have no Marseille accent, but uh, in French. Parfois, je lève la tête et regarde mon frère l'océan avec amitié. Il feint l'infini, mais je sais que lui aussi se heurte partout à ses limites. Et voilà pourquoi, sans doute, tout ce tumulte, tout ce fracas. C'est une citation de La promesse de l'aube de Romain Gary que je trouve assez appropriée à la situation dans laquelle nous nous trouvons. Uh, with these uh, last words, I would like to, to wish you, a, well, again, to welcome you, to wish you a a very good um, uh, conference. I will be with you this afternoon. I'm interested in uh, what will happen uh, during the whole conference, but especially this afternoon, because and then I have to go back to Paris before coming back to Marseille. And I understand that there was a sort of success because uh, more than 200 people have registered, either physically, and we are happy to meet each other, but also uh, uh, on video conference system. So I. I'm wish you a very successful conference. And uh, again, thank those of Alonvi, like Christelle Marlin, and those of Signores who have uh, initiated this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you for these thoughts, uh, Monsieur Ullier. Um, I'm going to ask yeah, the speakers of the, the organizers, actually, of the next session uh, to come to the floor. In the meantime, um, let me just say a few words about how we're going to proceed uh, this afternoon. So there will be a short introduction by the organizers of the session. Uh, and then we will have a keynote and four presentations, as you probably saw in the program. And we really encourage you to ask questions about these presentations uh, through the chat. You can connect to the site of the conference, and you have a space in the chat to ask questions. And we know this is not very convenient, but it's actually only 160 characters long. So it's the size of a tweet. Uh, but you can ask a question over s several entries. Um, and maybe during the debate. Uh, so we'll save all these questions as much as we can for the round table, which will come at the end. So the questions we will take after the presentations will only be really factual questions about the understanding of the presentation. Uh, the actual debates on the science that we want to have will be saved for the round table. And we will try and take stock of all the questions and ask them in a sort of organized way uh, to all the speakers that have participated in the afternoon. 
Um, we, we would like to stick to the schedule very strictly because people connect from various parts of the world. Maybe they don't want to listen to the whole conference. They want to listen to one speech and we want that speech to be at the time that we have announced. So we, I may have the unpleasant duty of uh, sometimes cutting off uh, people who um, have expanded a little. Um, and I, I will remind the speakers three minutes before the end of their speech that it's sort of time to conclude. Um, now, all this being said, uh, let me introduce the organizers of this session on conservation and evolution, which is actually an interesting contrasted title. Um, so here we have François Sarrazin, uh, who's professor at Sorbonne, Univer at Sorbonne University and who's also a researcher at CISCO, which is the Center for Ecology and Conservation Sciences. He also leads the Scientific Council of the FRB, uh, the Foundation for Research on Biodiversity. Jeanne Lecomte is professor of ecology at Université Paris-Saclay, uh, where she leads a lab called Ecologie Systématique et Evolution, which translates pretty simply into English. And um, Franck Courchamp is a senior researcher who leads a group on biology dy dynamics within the same lab as uh, Jeanne Lecomte, Ecology, Systematics, and Evolution. So with no further ado, I leave the floor to Francois. Thank you very much, Yves. So it's a real pleasure to introduce this uh, first session. If I can get the first slide, should I use a pointer? No, oh, sorry, my slides, please. <laughs> so, indeed, uh, we will have uh, this afternoon a first session dedicated to this uh, issue about, uh, the, about the, the taking into account the evolutionary context uh, when we discuss conservation uh, strategies. And uh, it may be a bit uh, surprising, as you said, Eve, to, to start such a meeting by uh, talking about conservation. Sorry, this is not very... Move. Whoops. Can I get the next? Yes. So why start uh, such a meeting uh, by discussing about uh, evolution? In fact, it is very clear that um, despite, uh, as we will see, uh, evolution is one of the very uh, dimension of life and biodiversity, it remains relatively rare to discuss explicitly about evolution in uh, international political agendas when we discuss about conservation of biodiversity. Of course, there is discussion about evolution in, at the IUCN, at the IPBS, but it remains sometimes very difficult to make it at the top of the agenda when we discuss for the main recommendation to take decisions. And we will discuss that also in the context of, for example, the sustainable development goals uh, later on. But the matter is that this is not simply uh, a matter of theory or a Western point of view, but this difficulty to address that uh, evolutionary issues is may, may be linked to some problems of cultural perception about evolution. The matter is that it is not a matter of theory, this is a matter of facts, and clearly there are more and more uh, scientific facts that support this evolutionary dimension of life. And we all know that uh, these life uh, forms, this biodiversity, has been shaped by more than three billion years of flows of matter, energy, genetic and cultural information, driven by functional and evolutionary forces. And even the fact that we are talking today with masks, with uh, uh, presentation and uh, also people on the web uh, two years after the organization of this meeting is due to uh, evolutionary disruption uh, linked to this uh, COVID pandemics uh, that we are uh, suffering from. And uh, this is clearly a real scale matter of mutation, uh, disruption, co-adaptation, etc., which is uh, an evolutionary process. So clearly there is a multidimensional uh, multi uh, challenge 
for governance associated with this uh, evolutionary dimension of uh, biodiversity. And that will be one of the main topics of the keynote that will be given by our uh, colleague Peter Sogard Jorgensen from the Stockholm Resilience Center. And following that uh, presentation, we will uh, continue by reminding that, in fact, conservation uh, was deeply uh, rooted initially in evolutionary biology. The, the very first papers and books that try to define what can be conservation biology as an academic field were strongly linked to evolution. The, paper, the books by Frankel, Soule, the seminal paper by uh, Soule trying to define what can conservation biology be was uh, trying to uh, clearly uh, reduce the uh, extinction rates and reduce the human effects on the evolutionary trajectory. W uh, following that uh, early uh, setup of conservation biology in the 80s, more and more works were focused on the emergence of ecosystem services uh, at the beginning of our century with, of course, we all know the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, where there were mostly interaction and discussion between uh, e e functional ecology and economics. And clearly, it appears that the colleagues involved in evolutionary biology didn't feel very concerned about that dimension. Even now, when we discuss the nature contribution to people, uh, particularly in the context of the IPBS, for example, uh, the the evolutionary dimension of life appears as some kind of support of all that uh, system, but is not really discussed in terms of consequences also on the evolution of the, of the process. But it is clear that when we discuss the drivers that lead that extinction crisis, we all know this uh, land use change, direct exploitation, climate change, of course, and it will be rediscussed later on, as Francois Houllier remembered. Uh, pollution, invasive species. It is clear that these drivers are likely to change the game in terms of evolution. But it is also interesting to look at the indirect drivers that shape these direct forces, our own demography and uh, sociocultural uh, dimension, the economics and technology that we are running uh, in our societies, our own institution and governance, our conflicts, and of course, epidemics, that are, own, that are themselves shaped by our values. And it is also interesting to discuss the roots and the consequences of these values in terms of evolution. So if we consider uh, evolution and, uh, for conservation action, it is clear that this evolutionary con uh, context constrains the uh, opportunity and the possibility for some uh, conservation actions. An uh, obvious uh, dimension is the matter of timescales. It is uh, often discussed uh, comparatively to uh, the speed of the global changes, and particularly the climate change, but not only uh, climate change. And it will be very interesting to rediscuss what we call uh, macroecology and uh, mac macroevolution, sorry, and microevolution in terms of timescales linked to geological timescales on one side or generation timescales that may be very different from one organism to the other on the other side. And Emmanuel Porcher from the uh, Cisco in the museum will uh, provide some views about this matter of uh, the role of macroevolution when we discuss about uh, conservation. But it is also interesting to look at the evolutionary consequences uh, of uh, conservation actions particularly when we look at some kind of gradient of anthropization that these conservation actions uh, generate. For example, the protection of population, species, and the reserve design, the protection of habitats, but as well the strategies of rewilding, restoration, conservation translocation from reintroduction to uh, assisted migration uh, are likely to, to shape these consequences. And in the same way, if we go to the top of the uh, anthropization, for example, in urban landscapes, uh, it is very important to try to see how we can already uh, discuss and, and observe and, and quantify these uh, evolutionary consequences. And we have the pleasure to have Anne Charmentier from the CEF CNRS, who will particularly focus on that dimension. And if we go a step further, we can also input, of course, in this uh, dimension on conservation, the matter of the um, domesticated biodiversity. 
And we will see that there is also a lot of issues about uh, the considering the evolutionary dimension of this uh, domestication, and it will be uh, introduced by Tatiana Giraud from uh, ESA, uh, in SACLEM, from CSRS2. And when we discuss that uh, matter of actions, it is clear that uh, one uh, concept that is uh, uh, recurrent in this uh, discussion is the matter of evolutionary potential. Many uh, authors uh, acknowledge or uh, recommend to try to maintain or enhance this evolutionary potential. But we will see with Emmanuel Millot from the uh, Université du Québec at Trois-Rivières uh, that this concept itself remains relatively unclear or should be uh, discussed uh, and clarified in order to uh, allow, if possible, more relevant recommendations. But when we want to discuss not only actions, but the ultimate aims of these actions, and so when we discuss about strategy, that includes uh, also this matter of uh, ultimate aims, we have to discuss about ethics. There will be a, a session dedicated to ethics at the end of this conference, and I think this is uh, extremely important. And briefly, we can remind here simply that uh, when we discuss about this uh, issue of the, the reason why we want to act or conserve uh, biodiversity, we are in a matter of discussion among humans about non-humans and what we want to keep, uh, maintain, save, restore among non-humans. And generally, it has been discussed in the uh, framework of ethics uh, about uh, within intrinsic values, instrumental values, or relational values that generated uh, different kind of approaches from purely anthropocentric approaches to biocentric or ecocentric approaches. With my colleague Jeanne Lecomte, we proposed uh, already to uh, try to integrate these debates uh, and, and see their complementarity into an evolutionary uh, context by trying to address the possibility of defining some evocentric uh, ethics in order to try to consider the evolutionary context and dimensions of uh, these uh, values and the, the consequences of their roots in some case for some of them. And when we discuss that also, for example, we can have a few questions. These are very open questions, and perhaps some of them will be readdressed during the round table, but this is only a, a starting point. Can we define or quantify some kind of humans' evolutionary footprints on non-humans? It's already difficult to discuss that in terms of ecological footprint, so can we imagine to have that in an evolutionary dimension? And could it be reduced, these evolutionary footprints, beyond our human direct self-interest, and in that case, if we look at that from a distance, I would say, by looking uh, at some kind of reflexivity about our own views, could this reduction itself constitute a real novelty at the scale of the evolutionary history? That is to say that our own relationship to the other life forms himself is an event at the scale of evolution, and that may explain perhaps the difficulties, the inertia, or the challenge or the positive or negative challenge that it constitutes for our own sake at the scale of our own evolution. So this talk will, uh, uh, this um, session, sorry, will include uh, the talks that I presented here. We will have a break and then the one table animated by uh, Eve. And we will, with uh, Frank and Jeanne, uh, try to keep an eye on the chat. So please uh, send your questions and it will be a pleasure to uh, try to include them in our discussions. Thanks very much, uh, Francois. Um, thank you for these opening thoughts and um, this uh, really uh, interesting idea of the evolutionary footprint uh, of mankind. So, I think we should start uh, with Peter because we have the clock that's ticking uh, with the first talk. Uh, which is actually the keynote speech of uh, Peter Sogard Jorgensen. Um, he, he's a macroecologist and evolutionary biologist by training, and he works to integrate those fields with socio-ecological research methods. So uh, Peter co collaborates both with the Stockholm Resilience Center and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences 
in Stockholm. So I hope we can make contact with him and hear his thoughts. I hope you can hear me. Great, we hear you. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you for this uh, great uh, and inspiring introduction to the conference. I am sorry I can't join you in person in, in Marseille. Uh, I'm sure it would be a much better place to be this time of year than here in Stockholm where autumn is coming fast. Uh, but um, yeah, let's, as you mentioned already, let's remind ourselves that a very good argument for considering evolution in conservation policy and practice is the exact fact that we can, I cannot be there today because of, uh, of the pandemic and I would say even more so because of the vaccine induced resistance, uh, the vaccine induced evolution of resistance that we have seen with the Delta variant just now. So, so I think it is a very appropriate topic, and I think it will be an increasing topic, uh, hopefully, in conservation and sustainability science uh, more broadly in the future. Um, so today I will talk about evolution and governance in social ecological systems. So, and I will introduce those concepts later. Um, but I, you can see this as an integrated Anthropocene perspective on conservation science. Um, and as you already mentioned, um, yeah, the Stockholm Resilience Center was founded in 2008. Uh, it was the biggest investment by the Swedish government in research, uh, in environmental research at the time. And it was a 10 year investment uh, to try and, and solve the many environmental crises that were already mentioned. Um, so I hope to be able to bring in a bit of the perspective that we you may find from researchers at Stockholm Resilience Center and integrated with <clears throat> these other concepts, uh, evolution in, in conservation science. Uh, I've divided my talk into three rough sections. So first, trying to set the scene for where we are today uh, in the Anthropocene, this human age. And actually, also what will might come come after the Anthropocene. Um, then I'll talk about the implications for conservation uh, science policy and practice, and discuss it more specifically with a couple of examples of what I call evolutionary or co-evolutionary challenges for conservation. And finally, talk a bit about how we can move towards uh, translating into action. Uh, and action-based science, uh, of course. But I think I, I want to start with this figure just to remind ourselves of the, that we are in a very turbulent period in human history and in the history of the planet. Um, of course, the planet has seen many things come and go, but, um, but certainly for us humans, this is a very uh, special time uh, that, that we are here, we, we have many rapid uh, accelerating global environmental changes taking place, driven by our vast increases in, in human dominance on the planet uh, over the past, well, certainly 70 years, but certainly also before then. Um, so the great acceleration, you can say, is, is part of that uh, in incredibly rapid uh, pace of cultural evolution that has led to incredibly paced uh, biological evolution in the environment over the past um, 70 years and longer. So to, to understand how evolution may and an evolutionary perspective can be important for conservation, I think we also first need to understand how we got here in the first place. So that is the evolution of the Anthropocene itself. And to do so, uh, we need to actually think in terms of evolution much more uh, broadly or in a much more diversified fashion than, than what we're used to within conservation science. So we need to think about evolutionary processes across multiple, multiple domains of organization, or you can say super domains even. 
This is a growing perspective within conservation science. Uh, Francois already mentioned this uh, very nice uh, perspective piece uh, with Shane uh, Lecomte. And we are, I think we will also hear about uh, uh, urban evolution later in this session. And, and there we also see now uh, papers coming out that try and integrate uh, social or cultural evolution with, with that of uh, rapid evolutionary change in urban environments. And it's certainly important for understanding the broader uh, sustainability challenges that we are facing today. So here are just a couple of examples of papers that have done, a, uh, I would say, a rigorous job at trying to integrate the more classical biological evolution, evolutionary perspective with a cultural evolutionary perspective um, to understand why we ended up here today. And so what do I mean with domains? Or what are these domains? Well, the first one I would say, we can think about it at the global scale as, as the geosphere. So, uh, made up of, of purely abiotic processes. Um, and of course, the, the geosphere has come out of a, a itself of, out of a long evolutionary sequence of very rapid transitions and or, level of organization. Um, but I think we shouldn't spend too much time on that here today, but it's good to remind, remind oneself about those uh, processes. And out of the abiotic domain, of course, come, comes the biosphere. Uh, through a process of emergence, uh, and I think nicely covered in, in the work by John Maynard Smith and Ursula uh, Smiley, um, and others have elaborated on that, and that's an active uh, field of investigation, of course. And so comes a third domain of organization, what you could call the anthroposphere, you could call it culture, or you might want to call it the sociosphere, so our, our uh, culturally transmitted information uh, in a very blended and mixed form of inheritance. Um, and here again, we have seen a very rapid, and I should mention that for the biosphere as well, well the, you could see the very rapid changes in, in scale of organization there. And as well for humans, you can see that over the last uh, 200,000 years, our capacity to organize across an increasing uh, level of, of scale um, has become evident and necessary. But we need one more domain, I think, because humans are not only behavior, we are also active ecological engineers creating material for our own use. So you can call that material technology, you can call it materials. Um, people often refer to it as the technosphere. And that, that's also an important and scientific perspective to understand the Anthropocene. And who knows where we will be in the future, but, but there are now papers actually uh, seriously investigating from a scientific point of view, what might be the next transition in terms of either autonomy or level of organization or hybridization or integrating of technology with, with uh, say human culture or by itself. Um, so this is mind boggling, but I think we are, it's also very exciting because we're at a, a uh, place in time where I think we're close to a, a, <clears throat> a new, you could call it synthesis. That's a very, mm, has a, that's a word with a long history in evolutionary uh, science, of course, uh, but, but maybe an Anthropocene synthesis uh, uh, for understanding sustainability. And the technosphere is interesting uh, because I showed you, it, you before uh, that it was Im uh, embedded in the social sphere because we create that technology, but but of course, the material technology we create consists of um, of abiotic matter, and I would say also uh, living matter. Um, and it's a growing domain on on the planet. And this blob is not this is not just a thought out um, blob. It's actually based on on hard evidence for the increase in uh, material mass on the planet. Uh, and if you include living matter that we've domesticated, which we'll hear about later, then, then it certainly outnumbers sort of undomesticated living matter by, uh, yeah, not by an order of magnitude, but it, 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 it's, we're, we're close to being there. Um, and that's a very rapid and recent change within the past uh, 
yeah, 70 years. And uh, this paper in Chatham from, from, from actually this year estimated that that transition might have, well, it's not a transition, but that intersection point might have occurred actually uh, somewhere around now, if you include other types of living matter and degraded materials as technology, then it, then it occurred already maybe in the 1970s. So the question then becomes how, how much are we now as humans locked into the evolutionary trajectory of, of the technosphere that of course we're, we're guiding it, but there's a strong feedback as well on, on our behaviors. Um, I think with, with those four domains introduced and just seeing the scale of, of the technosphere today, um, out outperforming in terms of mass all living all living matter um, it's not unjustified to to really think of the of the planet as a in one way as a global production ecosystem that's what we've turned it into whether we want it or not um, so it's largely organized for production of harvestable biomass food fiber or fuel um, whether it's on land or in, or in the oceans or other way in the water. And it has very complex uh, social drivers um, create, uh, creating the system. So here you see the increased scale over the past 300 years with uh, land under human use and intensive use increasing rapidly. Um, you see the technological material inputs increasing increasing rapidly here exemplified by, by uh, biocides, so including both antibiotics and pesticides. And then I think a very important feature for if we want to have this more integrated or understand this, uh, the implications of this integrated view of evolutionary domains and their implications for conservation um, is the connectivity in the, in the social sphere today. Um, here you see one example in terms of air passengers uh, increasing rapidly just in the past 50 years. But it's not, it, this connectivity occurs in other domains as well. We have uh, climate connectivities, we have trade, we have um, transnational corporations in other levels, uh, domains of organization. And um, of course, we've also in this rapid acceleration seen a, a huge uh, um, decrease in the diversity of life on, on the planet. Uh, so a, a sort of homogenization uh, at, at the global level. Um, but what may be the most tricky aspect of, of this system that we have constructed today is, is the separation in time, space and scale between the actions and consequences uh, of those actions today. Uh, and if you think about evolution more broadly, encompassing cultural evolution um, or classic Darwinian biological evolution and technological evolution, th those consequences can be thought of as selection pressures. But here's how, how one could see it uh, if you were looking down at the planet. Um, from a, a, a perspective of evolutionary control of humans on the planet. Um, so here we tried to map out based on Earl Ellis uh, uh, anthrome product mainly, uh, the degree of evolutionary control humans have on, on the surface of the planet. So in red, you see where we estimate that surfaces are completely res the, the result of artificial, artificial selection uh, uh, in yellow, you see surfaces where uh, domesticated and artificially selected grazers are a major force, evolutionary force on the, on the planet. And, and in green and blue, you see where human harvest, uh, hunting, fishing, whatever it may be, are major select selective pressures on the planet. And with in increasing darkness in the tones uh, implies a higher intensity of those uh, forces. So you see there are not many light uh, colors, at least on land. We mainly have the boreal forests, uh, a couple of deserts, uh, and then uh, some space left in the Amazon that we could argue are 
are fairly untouched. And when it comes, I talk about the scale of material technology before, but it, if we also look at, at the scale of uh, of just human domestic humans and domesticated uh, living matter uh, here in terms of mammals on the planet, it certainly outperforms um, wild mammals uh, by uh, yeah at least uh, three or four times. Um, it's not quite the same for for plants. I think their crops are estimated to be about two percent of, of the biomass, but that doesn't include uh, necessarily all trees. Um, but what you can at least say is that there's uh, herb, herb uh, in 2017 estimated there was around 50% reduction in the biomass of plants uh, due to our domestication processes. So our impacts in the Anthropocene biosphere are undeniable and that's why we we are can be said to be everywhere. Our human effects on the planet and life are practically speaking everywhere. Uh, so we can call it an Anthropocene biosphere. But what then about where are we heading? I mean, this is a very unstable uh, phase. Uh, we've come out of this, um, humans have developed out of this first stable oscillating pattern of ice ages and, uh, and uh, uh, middle uh, in between uh, periods uh, in the Pleistocene. And then taking advantage uh, of a, a longer stable period, uh, the Holocene to, to just take off in an explosive fashion in terms of our increasing dominance on the planet. Um, and so here I try to list some major processes, evolutionary processes that have been proposed that span multiple domains uh, as driving uh, both of these patterns, both the first, the appearance of stability in the non-human earth system, and then the appearance of a very unsustainable uh, trajectory. Um, so I would recommend the papers by Lenton and, and also Ellis and Snyder there. But of course, the we're really here today to talk about conservation, as we call it. Um, and that, that has to do with the now and here and the future. And so the, the big questions become, well, what does the future look like? And, and it that is a very difficult question for, for scientists to answer, of course, but, but there's an increasing effort of uh, directed at that question. Um, and I would say if, if there are some processes that we need to understand from an evolutionary perspective here, it has to do with human agency, foresight and governance. Um, um, if we want to understand where we might be going and why uh, or how. Um, maybe along with technological evolution. Um, so it could be that we're heading towards some type of just sustainability. Again, as I mentioned, others are discussing possibilities of technological singularities, or we're seeing now very concrete efforts to try and move ourselves to other planets. It may be that now we, we kind of, we ridicule that effort a bit, uh, but, but it's a lot of money being thrown at it. So if you want to take these future scenarios seriously also for conservation, we, we need to acknowledge that those efforts are there. And of course, those futures could also involve some type of undes a very undesirable future of human collapse. And these scenarios, future scenarios, I think are, are useful in terms of setting scientific agendas. And that's, uh, I really appreciate the, the paper by Francois and Jane. Uh, I, I really think it's one of the first papers to introduce sort of evolutionary, evolutionary scenarios for conservation. Um, and then that's, that, that's a, a daunting task. And, but I think it can help galvanize new and set new directions in research as well. Um, and so I particularly here just wanted to highlight this bottom scenario uh, that, that they identified, the deliberate overcoming of the Anthropocene. So some uh, future state where we both uh, manage or govern the, the biosphere for human long-term human well-being and also non-human uh, fitness. Uh, from some egocentric perspective. 
So I think that's that's very interesting and also challenging. Um, but I, I think it relates to a broader uh, perspective on, on where we might be going or where we might want to be going. Um, so if we consider the Anthropocene here as having uh, a new epoch that has emerged, we can disagree about the exact numbers, but within some, some time within the last hundreds of years, um, well, we might consider this new potential future of a sustainable relationship with the biosphere. We, we might consider it a, a completely new eon, which there's only been four of so far in the history of the planet, uh, where we deliberately uh, perform a type of planetary stewardship. Uh, but that goes beyond the biosphere. That includes, as was pointed out in that paper, that includes human well-being for long-term human well-being, but it also includes technology, it includes climate and, and the other parts of the abiotic uh, geosphere. Um, and the sapiozoic is a term that was introduced by, by Grinspoon in his book, Earth in Human Hands. And again, he's a physicist and, and looks at things maybe sometimes from a broader or a slightly different perspective, but I think uh, those are the four domains that kind of need to be taken into account before we can say that we are in a sapiozoic where humans are capable of managing these very complex processes. That basically involves everything from being able to uh, avoid um, a future asteroid uh, impact um, to also governing things like uh, artificial intelligence and technology and of course, evolution in the living organisms. It's not a very small ask, it's a huge ask uh, for us. Scientists, and we can of course play a big role there. We should play a big role there. So, but, but to really do that, we need to think about, I would argue, evolution across these four domains. Um, much more than we we do presently, but I think there's that trend that we're moving there. But we can we can help speed it along. Um, so now I want to turn to to the implications for for conservation uh, after this uh, maybe a little bit long introduction of the Anthropocene. So I'll speed up a bit now as it's more familiar territory. Maybe. Um, well, the first general implication is that we need to not think about maybe not call it conservation, but actually when we say conservation, what we should be thinking is a sort of uh, governance or governing. Uh, we biologists may be more used to call it management, but but when we talk about people as well, it's, it's good to call it governance uh, because most people don't want to be managed. They want to take part in, in processes. So we call it uh, a governance or governing of human environmental uh, co-evolution. Um, it's really what conservation today is about if we take this multi-domain multi perspective seriously. Um, another implication is that it becomes really difficult to define what the wild or wilderness is since we are everywhere. And even the places we are not, it's because of, of a deliberate effort from us not to be there. So um, it's, it's not a completely wild process. Uh, itself. So I think this is a, I encourage thinking about the whole, uh, any single grid cell you can find on the planet really, not, not just the, these last remaining wild places that some people are trying to identify. Of course they are very important, but we need to take a, a holistic perspective here. But it, it undoubtedly, the Anthropocene and its turbulence that we're seeing uh, also mean that we have a high level of complexity in, in implementing conservation policies and practices or just informing them. So there are complexities that we need to take into account. So this dominant paradigm of having economic, social and ecological uh, states and systems kind of separate, I think need, need to go very quickly to having the three of them embedded in one another and in, in interacting and creating emergent phenomena. 
that have feedback on the system itself. The, this connectivity I mentioned before in the turbulence also means that we cannot just assume a, uh, which there is some criticism, criticism of ongoing currently, this uh, global perspective of, oh, here's the conservation plan and this is what we're going to do, and that, then it's going to be implemented on the ground. We have a uh, high level of interactions across scale that also feed up. Small local phenomena can have rapid global consequences, uh, as we are seeing in um, numerous cases. And I think this is less uh, novel, I guess, for, for us, but that's maybe more at, at the, for some social scientists or environmental scientists thinking about nonlinear uh, relationships between drivers and states. Uh, and finally, it means also going from just trying to adapt to these environmental changes to actually deliberately uh, sculpting out or shaping the future of those uh, adaptive, or, so fitness or stability landscapes um, as are shown here. Um, so we need to acknowledge the need for complete new trajectories, I would say. And th those, those, I would say, are our insights grounded in, in the latest science on, on how social and ecological systems interact. Now, so if we, if we think about this transformation, the deliberate overcoming of the Anthropocene as some kind of uh, sapiozoic transformation, uh, we like, we, we at the Resilience Center have this general framework for thinking about transformations that I think is quite simple. You can find much more complex frameworks, but, but you can basically think about transformations as, as having three phases, some form of preparation phase, uh, uh, a shock initiating or a window of opportunity initiating a navigation phase, and then uh, and a third phase where stability in the system is being built. So I will try now and, and talk about some examples in relation to these uh, of uh, conservation, evolutionary challenges in conservation in relation to these phases. And I say co here because, uh, as I just mentioned, we cannot just think about evolutionary challenges if we want to translate uh, insights into policy or practice recommendations. It requires taking the social and the technological uh, feedbacks or context into account. So my own thinking of this has really evolved from just, has also evolved, I would say. Um, so in a, you can say at a, a sub uh, level of organization or domain from, from just thinking about humans as a driver of evolutionary change to thinking about how it could be, we could apply evolutionary insights to manage global challenges or address them. To really thinking more about taking governance perspectives into account, to really thinking about the co evolutionary uh, perspectives or the embedded perspective. Um, so just to acknowledge that. I, I, I think I see this as a highly stimulating uh, field of inquiry and um, it certainly is an interesting and challenging uh, arena to, to be trying to operate in. Uh, so here is one framework. Uh, it's not complete, but in, in looking at how humans influence evolution in the biosphere uh, through our activities. So, here we identified uh, five uh, major types of uh, impacts that our activities have, and they lead to then six challenges. I won't have time to talk about all of them today uh, due to time, but I will start by talking about the, maybe, yeah, some, maybe this is the one that we talked the least about sometimes, but that, that the Anthropocene biosphere actually creates ecological opportunity and that our ecological opportunity is often the, the seed or foundation for new evolutionary processes. So if you want to survive in the Anthropocene, when you look at where, where there's biomass here, uh, relatively unexploited biomass in terms of uh, ecological interactions, it's not difficult to see that uh, if you want to survive in the Anthropocene, it's good if you can survive in human habitats, generally speaking. You're much better off. You're much more likely to survive. You can also just look at a more simple view here. Uh, 
in terms of where there's wilderness and where there's not wilderness. Um, so all the purple areas here have some kind of human impact on the ground. And I think you have a much higher chance of surviving if you can survive there. So I call this, uh, this, this process that, that uh, this ecological opportunity facilitates is a, is a kind of anthropocentric colonization. Um, so as we could also just call the spillover into human habitats. And there are many examples of that, but I think given that, that we're in a pandemic, I just want to highlight the emerging infectious disease risk as, as one of those central processes uh, that, that, uh, that, come, that come as a consequence of, of this uh, transformation of uh, the biosphere and the ecological opportunity that it creates. And I think there's been nice progress in identifying drivers. So, so we know where risk is high. We know what types of species or semi-species, depending on how you look at viruses that are likely to make these jumps. So we can actually start to have uh, um, monitoring that is informed from those evolutionary insights. So if those uh, principles or strategies include monitoring these boundaries between wild and, and human habitats um, that are undergoing some kind of anthropogenic land use change and also has, has a high edge uh, to core ratio. And we can even think about designing settlements and production systems so that, that they promote more benign species and, and have higher resistance to the colonization of, of harmful species. So if, if we had to place this somewhere, uh, it would obviously be, we've just had a major window of opportunity for promoting these evolutionary insights into conservation practice and into sustainability, sustainable development more, more generally with, with the pandemic. So the question then becomes, are we, are we ready for it? Um, have we prepared for that transformation? The second uh, impact I want to talk about is, is the selection that we impose on organisms that are able to survive in, in those anthrums. So once you've colonized, or if you've all been here a long time, um, there are highly selective processes that you have to survive in these environments, such as uh, fishing, uh, various types of forestry, or you know, uh, various pollutants that are very in high concentration in, in human habitats. And, and I've spent, when I don't st study the overall Anthropocene as a whole, uh, I've been focusing recently on, on the challenges of ant antibiotic and pesticide resistance. And here, really considering those challenges as, um, as a result of, of you could call it niche construction, so technological innovation uh, of antibiotics and pesticides, creating complete new uh, challenges for living with the biosphere. So it wasn't important before we had massive use of antibiotics and pesticides, whether a, a bacteria was susceptible or resistant to an antibiotic because we were not using antibiotics. But, but with that invention, it created a whole new sort of operating space that we had to manage in terms of the susceptibility levels among insects, among weeds, uh, plants, and among uh, microorganisms. And in this paper from 2018, we, we assessed that yeah, we're seeing pan resistance. So, so that operating space is basically starting to be depleted uh, in some of these uh, forms of organisms, uh, especially gram-negative bacteria are worrying. I think we're up to now five or six types of gram-negative bacteria where pan-resistant strains are increasing. And this kind of runaway uh, or escalating pro-evolutionary arms race between human social technical evolution or innovation, if you want, and, and the biosphere, you know, that's a very emerging dynamic just coming from the introduction of these new technologies. But of course, it's not only about resistance when we talk about conservation, this massive use of biocides also have large ecological impacts beyond uh, resistance evolution, including on our own microbiomes. Uh, so we're starting to realize the ecosystem services that are being degraded from that use in our guts. So there are some principles that you can use uh, 
that I think are evolutionary informed. If you if you work with with uh, either harvest driven evolution or or uh, evol um, selective responses in, in undesired uh, organisms or, or challenging organisms for human well-being. And I just them here. They, they are, I think they're well known. It, it's about lowering selectivity um, and using a combination of approaches. And we think that integrated pest management is, is one of those examples, if you think about agriculture, uh, that, that can serve as examples for those practical uh, implementations. Also, so that conservation can learn from in terms of applying diversity. Um, transgenic crops on the complete opposite scale with just highly simplified systems, massive selectivity. Um, I have this figure here, but I don't have time to explain it, but I I'll refer you to the paper if you want to. Um, so how about the transformation then? In this paper, we, we propose that we need to think about the challenges of antibiotic resistance, not as a challenge of sort of trying to kill as many microorganisms as possible, which is sometimes the narrative that is coming out from media and then is influencing policy and sort of overriding scientific uh, insights. But it can, it can even also come from narratives uh, coming out of pharmaceutical science uh, or other types of medical science. Instead, we need to see antibiotics as a foundation of the modern health system. And very much the microbiomes uh, at various levels of organizations as, as our fellow travelers, provider of services, and with a few sort of big killers. Uh, you can say if you think about HIV or tuberculosis and so on, or indeed the pandemic. But the, the, the change in perception that we were trying to create here is instead of thinking about antibiotic effectiveness, which is a property of, of the antibiotic, the drug, we should think about managing a, a stock of antibiotic susceptibility in the global microbiome. Um, so that's a much more biosphere-based approach. I think you could even think of it as a very much a conservation relevant uh, approach. And it has even been discussed in some IP best documents. So where are we with the transformation? Well, I think, there hasn't been a big window of opportunity yet, but I think working with these narratives in a scientifically grounded manner uh, is a form of uh, preparing for such transformations. Uh, I won't go too much into this example of fecal microbial transplants, but just to highlight that there are more positive examples of positive change uh, towards much uh, lower selectivity. Um, in terms of uh, fecal microbial transplants, so uh, a really uh, uh, a form of ecological restoration taking place uh, rapidly over time. And in this paper, we, we uh, looked at the timeline of that, and it has a very interesting, you could say, evolutionary history um, and a very interesting window of opportunity all of a sudden popping up with a, with a virulent strain that could not be treated with antibiotics. So we had to change this to a strategy that actually had been there a long time, but had been a taboo in uh, Western medical science. So moving on to two other major challenges uh, is, of course, that they're all the species that, that cannot adapt to, to the Anthropocene, whether they are losing uh, evolutionary potential or what you might call the uh, uh, you can think of that as losing resilience, I think, um, or whether they are just constrained. It's not that there is any diversity out there to, to uh, select on, it's, it's just they're just constrained. So we also come with some principles for how to, to manage those, but since there will be another speaker talking about evolutionary potential, I will not spend too much time on it. Just to say an example of where that's really a concern is, is in the area of climate change and the intersection between conservation and climate change, uh, especially in tropical regions where we see that these, uh, um, the warm end of, of the niche spectrum, it, it looks like a, increasingly an evolutionary limit that, that doesn't evolve even when uh, there's just no variation there. It looks like most species have has this capacity to physiological capacity that goes up to a certain temperature and then there's sort of that uh, dead end. So. So this is where we then need to think about much more active approaches for conservation is the translocations where to evolution can inform that. 
evolutionary biology can inform those actions. And I think at the bigger scale, uh, the best way of, of preserving resilience is, is, through, uh, is through these half earth approaches. Um, that, that has now surprisingly a narrative that has become very popular and has been even been integrated outside of conservation biology into uh, climate change science and, and the type of science we do uh, at the Resilience Center when thinking about how, how we might, uh, when we think about climate tipping points, one of the best way of avoiding cli climate tipping points is, is this half earth strategy or not just saying that the land that is relatively untouched today, we cannot expand into that. But of course, that has huge ethical uh, implications that we need to take into account. But I would see, say this is a narrative that evolutionary conservation scientists can jump onto. It's a leverage point for promoting some of these perspectives. So yeah. And as I said, I didn't have time to go into everything here, uh, but but in, in the review paper from 2019, we discussed many more examples and relate them also to the sustainable development goals. I think you can, it doesn't matter what sustainable development goal you choose, uh, you will find areas where evolutionary science and, and conservation science can, can um, play a role. So then I wanted just in the final two minutes to focus on three future directions. So, Again, it's the need for studying and informing co-evolutionary governance. So if we can, when we think about conservation, think about the co-evolutionary governance feedback loop, that's a big and important change. And I think it's happening, but we need to move beyond that because we need to actually uh, create a science of implementation, uh, an implementation science, which is, uh, sort of big and burgeoning field in terms of public health and medical interventions. I think we're seeing some of it with, in terms of evidence-based conservation, but, but in fact, it needs to be driven by this culture of transdisciplinarity where you go out and engage with practitioners and policymakers, a deep interaction there. Um, I can come into some of these aspects later, uh, but I just wanted to give an example of that, I think. The work by, by Carly Cook and, and Carla Spro is an example of that deep engagement in terms of understanding uh, the perspectives of managers on evolution. What do they understand? What, what is harder for them to understand? What are we getting wrong in terms of our communication? What are actually relevant questions to ask? So I think there's a bright future ahead uh, and I look forward to hearing the rest of uh, the speakers today. Oh yes, and uh, finally, I think we should think about a future journal. Uh, so that really studies the interaction between evolutionary processes and society. Um, you have a journal today like ev evolutionary applications, but it's still very much bias here focused. You don't have the social type of evolution, cultural evolution, you don't have technology in there, very little about uh, climate or geosphere evolution. So, so this is uh, just my pitch for a journal that, that I would really like to see. But I don't want to run over time, so, so thank you for listening, and uh, I look, for, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Peter. So thank you very much. That was really a mind-blowing talk. Um, I think it raises so many questions that we should s sort of actually move on to the talks. Uh, so that we save all that together for the end. They're in sort of interaction with other issues that will be talked about. So um, maybe we could take now the talk of Emmanuel Porcher. I don't know if the technics is right here. Can can she actually hear us? Yes, hello. Can well, you hear wonderful. me? This is a great day. Thank, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, you have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you, Liv, and uh, thanks to uh, all the organizers for the um, invitation. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry also that I cannot be with you today. So the, the topic of my talk, uh, as you said, Eve, um, evolution and conservation is a surprising topic. Microevolution and conservation might seem even more surprising. 
I will uh, start the talk uh, maybe by um, giving a reminder of uh, the definition of microevolution, or at least the definition that I will use today because the, the concept is uh, a bit debated. So I will uh, simply consider today that microevolution is uh, the result of microevolution with an eye over a very long time from a human perspective that is millions to billions of years. So by doing that, I assume that the same mechanism are at play when we try to understand how the uh, ancestor to uh, wolves and dogs uh, evolved to produce the uh, current day diversity within the species of dogs. And when we try to understand how uh, the common ancestor to all life on Earth evolved to produce the current biodiversity, including, of course, the diversity within species, but also the diversity of species and all other uh, taxon levels, the diversity of function, the structural diversity, such as the diversity of body plants, and so on. So why uh, should conservation be concerned about microevolution? At first sight, it's not really obvious because conservation sciences have emerged as a crisis discipline. And uh, they generally have to dealt with urgent issues within very short time scales. But uh, in the seminal paper by Soule, and even before that, there is also an agreement that although um, conservation is crisis oriented, it should be concerned with the long-term viability of whole systems, and one of the um, um, normative postulates of conservation is that evolution per se is good. So conservation should be concerned, among other things, with the long-term evolution, which is uh, macroevolution in the definition I just uh, chose. This is a vast topic, the relationship between uh, conservation and macroevolution. So uh, today I will uh, only address it with uh, two different perspectives. Uh, first, a retrospective view in which uh, I'll try to show the uh, impact of humans on the product of past long-term evolution. And a, a prospective view uh, which uh, I'll try to forecast as best as possible what can be the consequences of humans on long-term evolution, that is after humans have visited from the planet. And also I would try to uh, highlight our suggestion to um, try and better include macroevolutionary thinking into conservation strategies. And I want to emphasize that all of this is of course uh, rather for, food for thought than um, definitely. So uh, let's start with the prospective view, which I entitled how humans are unlocking the product of billion years of evolution. I think you're all well aware that humans have a strong impact on biodiversity, which can be characterized in numerous ways. Uh, but for example, by counting the number of uh, extinct species or the number of threatened species or the number of population expectation. And a uh, um, general pattern is that these uh, threats and extinctions do not occur at random. And for example, uh, we know that uh, species with a larger body mass are more likely to be extinct or threatened than species uh, with smaller body mass. And not completely unrelated to uh, this uh, body mass issue, the uh, threats and extinction are also not distributed at random with respect to the evolutionary history of species, the long-term evolutionary history of species. So again, this can be characterized in a really uh, uh, a large variety of ways. And today I will discuss mostly phylogenetic diversity, which is one widely used metric, but there are many others. Um, phylogenetic diversity is defined for a set of species, such as an ecological community. And it's, it is simply the sum of the branch length on um, the path that connects um, the set of species on a phylogenetic tree. So here you have an example with a 
a higher phylogenetic um, diversity in the top uh, set of three species than in the bottom set of three species, which share a relatively common, uh, recent common ancestor and have low phylogenetic diversity. Uh, note that there are also um, metrics to characterize single species or taxa. Um, for example, the originality of a species, which can be uh, measured as the evolutionary distinctiveness when we talk about uh, evolutionary history, but I will not have time to uh, go into that. So as you might expect, the uh, extinction of species and threats to uh, species result in the loss or the expected loss of phylogenetic diversity, which can be measured as the number of million years that are lost uh, by uh, this uh, threats and extinction. And uh, in a large number of cases, but not always, the loss of phylogenetic diversity or the expected loss of phylogenetic diversity is higher than if the uh, extinction uh, were distributed at random among species. But again, this uh, changes uh, uh, depending on the taxonomy groups and in space. Uh, the drivers are um, identified. They are unsurprisingly the same drivers as for um, the other impact on biodiversity. They do have an example with um, the effect of urbanization on the phylogenetic diversity of native bird species. And this study shows that between highly urbanized and um, not very urbanized uh, areas, there is a loss on average of almost half a billion years of evolution. Um, one thing to keep in mind, however, when characterizing this, uh, these changes in phylogenetic diversity is that um, for many taxonomic groups, the, the phylogenetic diversity and its changes remain fully known. Um, and this is particularly true for uh, all unicellular uh, taxa, uh, including bacteria and archaea which uh, represent a, a large fraction of phylogenetic diversity. Remember that when we discuss conservation, very often uh, we are focused on animals. And animals. These uh, non-randomness in uh, extinction in threats, uh, uh, or at least in threats, uh, could be compensated by a, a non-random uh, distribution of conservation actions. But this does not seem to be always the case. Uh, for example, in this uh, recent study um, analyzing the, the distribution of rate reduction programs in um, mammals and birds, um, they showed that um, the subset of species that uh, are concerned with uh, reintroduction tend to be fully representative of the phylogenetic diversity of the whole groups. But on the other hand, the reintroduced species tend to be more evolutionarily distinct than expected by chance, which may counterbalance the diversity. Another important point uh, when we study uh, phylogenetic diversity as a way to measure the impact of humans on um, past, uh, in the product of past evolution is whether we should be concerned um, with phylogenetic diversity beyond its intrinsic value. So th this regards the values of biodiversity. And there are two other uh, motivations for being interested in uh, phylogenetic diversity uh, in conservation. The first one is that it can be considered a proxy for functional diversity, and even uh, a better proxy than functional diversity itself to characterize ecosystem function and ecosystem services. And they're not going to go into many details here because there are tons of studies addressing this uh, question of the relationship between functional diversity and phylogenetic diversity, just showing an example here. Uh, in general, they rely on the assumption of uh, trait conservatism, such that two species that are phylogenetically close tend to share the same trade values or similar trade values. Um, and also on the assumption that phylogenetic diversity is more integrative than uh, functional diversity because it uh, can uh, incorporate traits for which we don't know yet that they are important to understand the function of the traits. However, these assumptions are not always made. 
net, and clearly um, the, um, this is an ongoing debate as to whether phylogenetic diversity is such a good proxy for functional diversity. Another uh, motivation for studying in phylogenetic diversity is that it could be a proxy for evolutionary potential. And I will not uh, also go into many details here because I think I'm going to need to talk more about that later. Um, the only thing I will say is that in general, there is a solid theoretical basis for the role of genetic diversity within species in, uh, in the evolutionary potential but much less theory for the role of diversity above species level as a component of evolutionary potential. And I think the general agreement now is that conserving phylogenetic diversity uh, is potentially a good way to present future options for humanity, be there uh, options in terms of functional diversity or in, a, in terms of evolution. So um, we have a consensus that Humans now are impacting the product of past long-term evolution. And the next step is try to understand how these uh, impacts may have consequences on the evolution on the long term, that is in the millions or billion years to come, including after humans have visited from Earth. Uh, Again, there are many uh, different um, aspects to this question. Um, so today we'll just uh, discuss two of them. Uh, the first one is that humans uh, impact biodiversity in a non-random way. And this imposes some kind of anthropogenic selection, which uh, Peter just mentioned before, both within and among species. And this pattern of selection may have strong impact on the composition of biodiversity, uh, what I will call evol the evolutionary trajectory, uh, through which uh, we can, humans can seriously, seriously change this composition in the same way as uh, a meteorite and maybe other environmental factors uh, changed the dominance of reptiles on Earth uh, 65 million years ago. Um, the other component is that humans have a general effect of decreasing population sizes and increasing extinction rates, which uh, in general may lower the diversity, both the genetic diversity, but all other uh, components of diversity that's in functional phylogenetic. This is also an important consequence of uh, human activities but it is likely to be more transient if we think on very long time scale uh, than the effect on the composition and biodiversity, because in theory, this effect should, should stop once uh, the impact of humans stop. And uh, re-diversification should take over uh, and, and recreate the lost diversity. Uh, just a quick note on how uh, humans have an effect on um, the diversity of species. So this depends on diversification, which is the difference between speciation and extinction. And uh, humans have uh, caused extinction of species at rates which are uh, largely above the background extinction rates. And this seems to be true even uh, when extremely conservative estimates are derived as in uh, the study of Tobias and Paul Walters. But uh, some claim that uh, on the other hand, uh, humans also have created the condition for um, an increase in speciation rates, particularly through the increase in migration and uh, the possibility for uh, speciation by hybridization of species, such that the speciation rates may actually counterbalance the increase extinction rate. So this is a controversial and highly debated issue uh, because um, this in recent increase uh, speciation rate could be merely, merely a bias, which is uh, referred to as the core of the present. Uh, in which many of the species that have recently appeared are probably likely doomed to extinction very quickly. And they wouldn't be detected as extinction uh, if we were to estimate extinction rates uh, 
in a thousand or a million years from now. Okay, last, um, uh, just a suggestion on how maybe to um, uh, better uh, incorporate um, microevolutionary thinking uh, in conservation, uh, and particularly how to uh, have an effect on the diversification rate. One option could be to try to focus not only on patterns of biodiversity, but also on processes generating this biodiversity. And this can be done by using uh, relatively novel approaches that uh, enable to estimate the past speciation and extinction rates, how they vary in time, and how they vary with environmental variables. So these are term phylogenetic approaches in a broad sense. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, of a study on tropical birds that show that the, the areas with the highest diversity of species are not necessarily the areas with the highest diversification rates. So this uh, question, the relevance of uh, biodiversity hotspot approach in terms of long-term conservation. Now I'll skip the second example because I think I'm running out of time, but I just want to mention that there are major caveats with this uh, um, phylogenetic approaches. Um, there are still some strong uncertainties uh, regarding the reliability. Um, the re reliability of inferences made from the phylogenetic trees alone. So there need to be more work on the theory, and it seems to be important to couple these approaches with uh, fossil data as a complementary approach. So to conclude, we are left with um, a few very broad scenarios uh, in which probably diversity per se is not a problem, again, on the long term, over millions or billion years, but there are very likely short-term consequences for humans and, and if the uh, diversity levels change. Uh, however, uh, human can affect the trajectory of biodiversity a lot, and this change is most likely uh, irreversible. And we have to ask ourselves whether it is acceptable that we leave such a heavy evolutionary footprint. For our uh, conservation choices know um, now, they matter also for later. And we'll have to uh, see whether um, the different uh, options that we have. Uh, that are related to the different values that we attribute to biodiversity. Um, are they connected? Are there trade-offs between this option? And do we have to make choices uh, among the different options? And something I haven't said, but probably that will be said in the, in the next talk, is that uh, our uh, ability to predict evolution on the short term are not great, but on the long term, they're really poor. So probably the safe uh, approach for conservation of uh, or, or to uh, limit the impact of humans on long term evolution is to try to conserve large population and large areas, uh, which is related to the Hoffer's project that Peter mentioned earlier. I will stop that. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the people that helped me put this talk together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. I really like the thought that conservation is a crisis discipline, but it must be concerned with long-term viability. I think that's really uh, one of our great problems. Um, so let me just remind you before I give the floor um, uh, to Anne that um, we, we do need your questions, and we would like you to use this chat that we've made available for you. Uh, if we want to have a rich debate at the end, uh, your interactions are really useful, so please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Um, yeah, the chat is, is on the site of the conference. Uh, I hope everybody has gathered that. Um, so now let me give the floor to Anne Charmontier, um, who, is on the, who works for, on the CFA lab in Montpellier. Thank you very much. Actually, I think I'm supposed to get rid of this 
for 15 minutes <laughs> or 20. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for um, the uh, transition that Emmanuel just did between our two talks. Uh, so I am going to change gears um, as um, Emmanuel Porcher has been talking about macroevolution. I will be uh, talking about microevolution, um, which um, thank you. Uh, so that is a changing uh, a genetic changes that happen across generations within populations of the same species. And I will give you a glimpse about what we know of such microevolutionary processes, especially in the uh, typical context, uh, the context of cities. So. Uh, on urban biodiversity. So, as most of you know, for a microevolutionary process to occur, so for an evolutionary response to be seen in a given trait, the trait needs to be heritable and it needs to be under selection. And in fact, um, over several decades, the best knowledge that we had on these evolutionary responses and the best progress that was made in understanding evolution in action were made in the fields of um, animal and plant breeding science, and especially uh, using tools such as quantitative genetic tools that allowed us to actually predict evolution. So for example, here the breeder's equation, which could be used, uh, let's say, by a farmer that wanted to know how the milk yield would increase in his farm. He could use this, or he can still use this kind of equation to predict the evolutionary response of milk yield, big R, uh, based on the heritability, so the genetic determinism of milk yield, and the selection that the farm was uh, um, impacting on the cows. Now, in the wild, predicting evolution in such a way is, well, I shouldn't say, now that I've listened to Peter's talk, I shouldn't say in the wild, I should say in free-ranging populations, because we no longer have wild areas. Areas. Uh, but in free-ranging populations, let's say, um, the situation becomes a bit more complex because we have several processes that will intervene and influence these uh, heritability and selective processes, especially gene flow, genetic drift, or um, mutation, be it genetic or epigenetic mutations. And I'm not going to talk about today about cultural evolution and cultural, we could say, mutations, but this is something we can discuss um, later on. And uh, the environment and its heterogeneity will impact all these processes. So for example, when the environment is fragmented, high, highly fragmented, there might be uh, restricted gene flow or higher genetic drift. When the environment is more heterogeneous, it might influence the expression of heritability and change the selective pressures. And uh, a lot of environmental stresses or novel environments might also change the selection or promote new epigenetic or genetic mutations. So this is a, a situation that is complex, but yet we do have a few examples where we have actually studied, and by we, this example is not me. Actually, I'm not going to talk at all about my research today, so this is cleared. Um, and we, but we do have some really nice examples where evolution was witnessed and observed and even predicted. And of course, this is probably the first very, very well-detailed study, uh, the uh, study of Biston Betularia, the pepper moth, uh, whereby uh, industrialization in the northwest and, and of England and North Wales, uh, industrialization and especially uh, coal uh, ind industries created a change in the environment whereby the trees were becoming black. And this led to the evolution and uh, pervasive form of the black morph of this, um, this butterfly, the pepper moth. And this black carbonaria morph actually spread across the population because it was selected in this new background. We know now that uh, this uh, black morph is due to a big genetic change in a transposable element. And what is really, really nice about, I was going to say cool, because uh, evolution is cool, isn't it? Uh, and it, in this situation, what was really nice is that there was actually reverse evolution. When in the 1960s, the legislation to improve air quality changed the uh, habits of these industries, and actually the coal uh, industry kind of declined at least in most of the uh, northwest of England. And we then saw that um, natural selection in the reverse way was favoring uh, the white morph, which then became pervasive and there was a reverse decline. Okay, so this is one example where we witnessed evolution and we can see that it was uh, as a consequence of the anthropogenic uh, forces, so human forces in the environment. 
Well, in fact, this is uh, what we're starting to realize is that in this case, this was, uh, let's say, air pollution that induced uh, a novel environment and changed the selection and promoted a mutation. And in fact, what we have seen in the last few decades is that most of the uh, good studies that we have of evolution that we has, has been observed, so microevolution observed and uh, studied in free-ranging population, were in situation with um, anthropogenic forces at hand, uh, particularly f fragmentation, uh, heterogeneity, and environmental stress, which, which I mentioned before. And cities are areas that are actually uh, catalysts because they concentrate a lot of these uh, factors. So in cities you find high fragmentation, which can lead to reduced gene flow, increased genetic drift. You, you can find high heterogeneity, especially between the uh, more natural and more anthropogenized areas of the city. And you can find a lot of novel environmental stresses such as the heat island. I'm, I'm not sure I can use this. Uh, we're here now, but I think people online don't see my, um, I'm not going to use it, the dot. But uh, so cities are characterized by a heat island, uh, um, heat urban uh, island effect. There is high air pollution, uh, water pollution, disturbance by humans, by cars, and also, of course, um, light pollution and um, sound pollution. So the, there are really a concentration of these uh, novelties and stresses, we can say. And so it's in the literature, it's highly suspected that cities will be places where selection forces will change very drastically or have already changed. And so we should find a lot of examples of microevolution. I'm going to give three of these examples examples here to give you a glimpse of what uh, we can describe in terms of evolution in action in this context. The first example uh, is a study that was uh, done in the, the harbors, several harbors of the um, northwest Atlantic coast of the United States. You have here a picture of New Bedford Harbor. And in these harbors, there is a cocktail of different chemicals that are released by the industry and especially very high level of PCBs. Um, uh, so this is an example where I'm using this uh, icon of the water pollution. And so in these harbors, these high PCBs levels and other chemicals are leading to um, a drastic decline in most of the uh, uh, water life, and especially all the fishers uh, basically die. But there's this one fish, the Atlantic killerfish, that seems to have survived. Um, in these harbors, and the, um, th this is how the story goes. So if you sample this killifish in four different harbors in what we will call tolerant areas, and these are the T1 to T4 areas here, you find the species, um, and you find, and you can see this on the right-hand <laughs> draft, this is going to be tricky, um, that if you sample this uh, fish in uh, sensitive areas in, in, in the same estuaries and uh, you put all these fish uh, at different PCBs level, well, you can see that the fish that were sampled in the tolerant areas, they can sustain, and this is uh, the survival of the fish, they can sustain quite high level of PCBs, whereas the fish from the uh, sensitive areas, S1 to S4, they, they basically all die. So it was shown that these uh, fish in estuaries where there's very high levels of PCBs are uh, 8,000 times more resistant to the chemical po po uh, pollution. And what is interesting in terms of conservation is that um, it was shown that this is most probably due to the fact that this killifish in particular, compared to other species, had very high levels of genetic variation. It was also shown that in all these four different estuaries, the same molecular pathway uh, was selected um, and allowed for the tolerant populations to survive. So we're here in, uh, as an evolutionary biologist. Uh, this is a very striking, neat example of convergent evolution in these four different estuaries. Another story, this is my second example, about convergent evolution regards this heat urban island effect. So as you may know, and you probably know, uh, cities are much warmer than the natural areas outside of cities. Uh, we have a difference between three to four degrees to up to 12 degrees between the center of the city and the outside environment. And this is a story of the um, crested anole, so a lizard that is, studied, is presently studied in, in the, on the island of Puerto Rico. I actually just saw a tweet about someone that is right there on the field to do some field work, so it's an ongoing study. 
And um, these, uh, this research team has sampled anolis in different pairs of urban and forest habitats. So the four dots that you see on the map are in each case forest and urban habitats. And the top uh, figure here shows that if you look at the genetic background of these four um, environments, then you can see that, oops, I need to go back. Uh, then you can see that the, the genetic background is very different. So this shows that there was probably independent colonization because the, the different urban uh, populations of this crested anole are not uh, similar genetically. So we're in a situation where each time um, anoles in the city come from the nearby forest. And as you can see on the bottom graph, in every case where they have sampled and submitted again these anolis to different temperatures, the critical temperature that can, at which these um, lizards can survive is quite different, and it's higher for urban lizards than what it is for the forest lizards. And we have again, and I'm not going to show obviously the, the uh, genetic results in details, but we have again a demonstration here of convergent evolution whereby there's a parallel signature of selection with one protein synthesis gene that is in each case associated with the heat, the higher heat tolerance of the urban lizards. My last example um, has uh, the theater of the uh, London Underground. You have probably heard about this story. So the underground is a very uh, specific system to look into uh, novel constraints because it gathers uh, many of the different um, parameters of the environment that I cited initially. So there's very high fragmentation, obviously, between the different tunnels and between the underground and what happens above ground. There's a lot of environment heterogeneity, uh, like the landscape underground looks nothing like the landscape above ground. And there's an increased urban heat island effect because the underground, at least in London, I know, is much warmer than what the temperature you find above ground. And this is a story uh, of an insect. Um, and uh, the, so the uh, spatiation from Cules pipiens of a new uh, species of mosquito, Cules molestus. So there's still a little bit of debate as to whether this Cules molestus is a true new species or a, a subspecies, but in any case, it has diverged quite strongly genetically from the Cules pipiens that we can be bitten by uh, above ground. So this Cules molestus is in the London, London underground, and because of uh, different uh, characteristics that I cited above, it has completely changed a lot of its habits. So first of all, fragmentation has led this species to change its, um, its breeding behavior. So it's no longer in swarms, but it's really in pairs that can meet in the long underground tubes. Um, it has also changed because of the high human presence. These mosquitoes are no longer more attracted by avian blood, but they're attracted by human blood. And finally, because of the her urban heat, it has changed its lifestyle and no, it no longer has a diapause. So as a note, this, uh, this mosquito is actually found in all the underground systems around the world. Okay, so I've, I've given you a glimpse of, uh, thank you. <laughs> Yes, I'm almost done, actually. Uh, but I do want to uh, link with the conservation issue that is at hand today. Um, and uh, I am going to have to go a little bit quickly. So I'm giving here an example of how we can fit evolution and our knowledge on evolution into conservation and management practices. This is a paper that appeared last year and has a, a whole set of different scenarios. Uh, and I'm presenting only two, uh, basically the most um, um, simple ones. One of them is the where your management target is a locally adapted conservation priority that can be found in part of the city. And the second is a locally adapted pest species that you actually want to get rid of. In the first case, these are different management tools and evolutionary scenarios that can be used, especially stocking or assisted colonization, which allows for the, the population to spread in different patches of the city uh, and increasing connectivity. But one thing we need to keep in mind is that if we increase connectivity, by creating bridges, for example, between the different patches, um, then we might actually lose some local adaptation that has happened in some of these patches because of the gene flow um, increasing the, um, the genetic heterogeneity. In the second case, we can change habitat quality, for example, by removing human waste. We can decrease gene flow by creating barriers. 
and we can do callings, and these callings can be sequential in different years. But we do need to keep in mind that if we, for example, create barriers, then these barriers might actually decrease gene flow for other non-targeted species. So this shows how the situation is very complex. Now, to add a layer of complexity, this was mentioned in, in Peter's talk, of course. Um, we now understand that when we study the eco-evo dynamics in the urban system, we also need to integrate the, the social factor, the human factor. And uh, this is a paper that was published uh, a few months ago by a mainly North American uh, cohort of researchers. And they basically described how so, so the social factor, for example, political or economical decisions can impact, say, connectivity here. Um, and so gene flow uh, of the different species, or for example, the different neighborhoods and the different communities within a city can have different preference uh, for, for different phenotypes and also influence this dynamics. This is my last slide, and I'm linking uh, this kind of social and hum human factor idea um, with um, one last thought, which is that as an evolutionary ecologist, I used to have very little contact with the greater public. Now that I work in the city, it's actually a really nice way to open up my science to urban dwellers, human urban dwellers, via projects such as uh, Citizen, what we call actually more community science projects now. Uh, it's a very good way to communicate about evolution as well uh, to the greater public people that we meet in the city. So I'm always very grateful for opportunities that I have to talk about my science to the greater public and get inspired by them. And for opportunities such as this one where we can mix our uh, fundamental evolutionary uh, knowledge with conservation issues. So I, I thank the organizers for inviting me. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. So, so as I've already said several times, your questions on the chat, please, which is on the internet site. And now I'm giving the floor to Tatiana Giraud uh, from Ecologie Systématique et Evolution uh, in Orsay. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, I will uh, uh, speak uh, today about uh, what we have been doing on the domestication of uh, cheese fungi and how this uh, can inform uh, more generally on the evolution and importance of biodiversity in domesticated organisms. So we have been studying the, the white mold uh, that is used to uh, make the camembert and the brie and uh, the blue mold that is used to make the blue cheese worldwide. So, so we have been studying the domestication as a model to understand adaptation and diversification because that's really the same process of uh, selection and adaptation. Um, and uh, so the classical example you have already seen today is the humans that have selected, uh, that have domesticated uh, wolves uh, to give a wide variety of uh, different uh, dog breeds with different characters, different uh, phenotypes, behaviors. And uh, it's really the same process as natural selection, except that it's a much more recent and much, much, much stronger selection, uh, and for, uh, usually for known traits, so it's easier to decipher uh, what happened, what are the processes of adaptation. And in addition, it has a applied importance because, of course, uh, we want to know how the domesticated uh, organism evolves and uh, how do we can uh, have a sustainable use of these domesticated organisms. Um, so actually, um, uh, uh, even Darwin, uh, in his book, uh, The Origin of Species, he's used domestication as a model and as an illustration of how natural selection works uh, based on uh, how the, uh, artificial selection work, uh, works during domestication. And he used in particular the, the domestication of the pigeons uh, to explain how selection works. So, uh, if you take a, a wild population of pigeons and you want uh, to breed a, a white uh, breed of pigeons, so you select the, the whiter uh, parents and you allow only them to reproduce. So the next generation you will have a, a bit of whiter offspring and among them you will still choose the whiter ones and from generation to generation you, have, you will have a, only a white population. 
And that's exactly the same thing in natural population. You have a, um, a genetic variability, so illustrated here at the bottom by the color and the size of the points. So you have a genetic variability with a lighter and bigger individual, which is genetically determined. And uh, if the, the, here the um, uh, larger and uh, darker individual have a higher probability of surviving and producing offspring, of course, the gen next generation you will have more uh, darker and uh, bigger individual. And from generation to generation, the population will evolve to a darker and bigger population. That's how selection works. But you, you see that it only works because there is genetic variability, right? Without genetic variability, you cannot select anything. And, and at the end, if you exert a too strong selection, you have no more viability. And so you cannot have any, any more evolution, any more adaptation. And so that's crucial uh, during uh, the domestication and natural uh, evolution uh, to keep genetic material to fuel evolution and to fuel adaptation. And that's how, uh, a bit what uh, also Darwin illustrated in the tree you have here. The, that was the single picture in his book. Uh, illustration so the diversification of life, but really uh, as a dynamic process, uh, because you, you can see at each node there is uh, like a some variability, phenotypic and genetic variability, and then uh, diversification from this variability by competition, by uh, uh, adapting to the environment, and it's only this, this diversification and answer to the environment that fuel the diversification. And it's really important uh, for the conservation of uh, natural population and domesticated organisms to really see this biodiversity as the dynamic process and not as an um, equilibrium that we should conserve as a static equilibrium. It's really the dynamic we, we aim to conserve so that evolution can uh, pursue further and we need to keep the, the diversity for, and the condition uh, so that this process is maintained and not only the, the extant species. And uh, so uh, another way of illustrating this issue of uh, genetic diversity, and in particular during domestication, is that you have often what we call bottlenecks. Uh, so if you take at the beginning a population with several colors illustrating the genetic variability, and you only choose a few individuals to reproduce because they have beneficial traits, for instance, or just by chance, so you, then you have a very highly reduced diversity, right? And that's what is called bottleneck. And then Obviously, the evolution then is yeah, the evolutionary potential, potential is reduced. And also, by selecting a few beneficial traits, maybe you will also, by chance, select some associated deleterious traits that you don't want. And in the domesticated organism, there are some dog breeds, for instance, that cannot reproduce by themselves anymore. We have to inseminate there. They are not able to reproduce alone anymore. And the same for the bananas, like you can see here. We have selected uh, a bigger banana without seeds, but then, uh, the, so the wild banana, they have a lot of seeds that are uh, necessary for them to reproduce, and the, the domesticated banana cannot reproduce anymore by themselves. And the last example is the domestication of the apple tree. So we have uh, selected for bigger fruit, better color, uh, but in the process we have lost a lot of disease resistant traits, disease resistant variability. So they are very sensitive to many diseases like the apple scab here. And so, and by selecting some traits, so we have by chance uh, lost, uh, uh, lost of variability. Uh, and if the natural population uh, that have this resistant trait does not exist anymore, we cannot even then incorporate them uh, back in the domestic tree. Um, and that's also a point that uh, Nikolai Vavilov uh, uh, highlighted. So he's a Russian scientist. Um, uh, he, has one of the, uh, he has been one of the first uh, elucidating the crops domestication process and where they come, where they come from, their center of origin. And he highlighted the importance of genetic diversity genetic isolation, gene flow to fuel adaptation and, and, and to be able to a uh, sustainable use of these crops. So you have an illustration here. Of the, so if you have different varieties uh, keep, kept, for example, in different farms, in different locations, they will evolve. They may fix different traits, but in different uh, locations, they will fix different traits. So overall, you will keep more variability. And if you have gene flow among them, you will fuel adaptation and allow migration of beneficial alleles. And so all of this is important in the process of keeping this, the, the, the diversity and, and to allow for evolution. 
And so, un unfortunately, uh, Vavilov so died from starvation in jail because uh, the, at the time uh, the, the idea of genetic uh, diversity and variability as important in evolution was not uh, a, a good time to have in, in Stalin's uh, uh, country. So we have been studying the domestication of cheese fungi in this context, and uh, so that the mold, um, penicillium mold, so they are called penicillium because uh, you can see the, the, um, uh, they, grow, they grow spores from the, like a pencil. Um, so there are many, many penicillium species, and uh, some of them uh, are used for cheese making, but they are really uh, dispersed in the phylogenies. It's like a genealogical tree, and you have uh, some uh, penicillium species uh, spoiling fruits uh, or found in the soil, so also used for uh, uh, trichure mating and some uh, uh, penicillium rubens have been one where we identify the antibiotic, uh, the, the first antibiotic, the penicillin. And so we have been studying in particular penicillium camemberti, so the white mold, and penicillium roqueforti, the blue mold, so that, that are very distant, like just maybe like us and the and pigs, so these very distant species. So that represents a parallel adaptation, a convergent adaptation to the same environment, the cheese, very different from the plants where the ancestors lived. And so we have been uh, trying to understand what traits uh, have, been, have been selected by humans, how, what, what was the genomic mechanism that allowed the adaptation, and whether there were de uh, degeneration of some traits. And so this is really domestication, beca because people really choose the strains that they would want to inoculate to make good cheese. They, they took the spore from the good cheese, and then they cultivated, as you can see here at the beginning, from breads. They inoculated on the breads, cultivated the strains, take them back in the cheese. Uh, so now it's more in petri dishes, more ster sterile environment, and we can buy spore that we inoculate in the cheeses. And so we can think of different uh, um, uh, traits that could have been uh, selected uh, by humans. So the colors, uh, the, the aroma and flavor of the cheese, obviously, but also how the, the fungus uh, uh, can use the sugar, the protein, the lipid in the, in the milk and whether they will uh, produce, toxin uh, produce toxin because many penicillium fungi produce toxins that can be harmful to humans. But the toxin actually, it's like the antibiotic, it's done to compete against other fungi, so it can also be useful for humans so to avoid these spoiled cheese with undesired fungi. And uh, so that's also why we put a lot of sal salt on the cheese to avoid the contaminants. And so the, the, we may also have selected strains that could be able to exclude the undesired uh, molds. So we studied the, the, the genomes of these fungi, and one striking uh, pattern that emerged is that they all had the same, uh, some shared gene, highly similar. And given that phylogenetic distance, it meant that uh, they, they transferred uh, genes among them, only the cheese fungi, very recently in human time. So there were horizontal gene transfer, like in the cheese, where they acquired the beneficial genes, allowing very rapid adaptation. And precisely the genes that were horizontally transferred, they were involved in the metabolism of the, of the sugar found in the milk, the, the lactose and galactose, and also involved in competition against other fungi to exclude contaminants. And so, so to make a long story short, uh, we reconstructed the history of the domestication of the blue mold, the Penicillium roqueforti. And what we found is that there was not just one single population adapted to cheese, but two cheese populations. And one of the cheese populations is only found in Roquefort. So you know Roquefort is a PDO, a protected designation of origin. So we have to um, uh, put the cheese in the cave in roquefort sous sulzon and use the local strains. And so this allowed to keep some variability in this population. There is some genetic variability, also the, there have been a strong bottleneck. But there is another population where there is actor, that is used for all the other cheese worldwide. So one single strain with one genotype, no variety, variability at all, that is used for all the other cheeses worldwide beyond Roquefort. And we found two, sorry, two other populations uh, one specific to silage, uh, spoiling silage, and th they can produce toxin there, very dangerous to cattle, and one population also adapted to human environment because it's only food spoiler. So we have lost a lot of diversity, and the horizontal gene transfer was only in this single strain used for all blue cheese worldwide. 
And so we studied the adaptation and degeneration, and we found many traits that looked to have been selected by humans. So in the non-Rock4 population, we found a, indeed a higher competitive ability to exclude contaminants, a faster growth on cheese, so better use of lipids, protein, sugar, a loss of toxin production, they produce bluer cheese, so we made uh, many experimental cheeses, and we found that indeed the, the cheese were bluer, were better than those uh, made by the silage or the force polar strain that didn't smell anything, and they had a higher salt tolerance, but they also had degenerated because they, they are not fertile anymore, they cannot reproduce sexually anymore, and they have a slower growth in heart condition. And in the rock for population, so there were more genetic diversity, but also more uh, the diverse aroma, while the, the, the single strain used for all the blue cheese worldwide is, uh, always produces the same aroma, right? There is no variability. And we cannot cause them to generate now more variability because they have lost the, the ability of sexual reproduction uh, because of this loss of diversity, because we all only clonally replicate them. So we cannot generate any more diversity from these. Um, and to, and th th that posed really problems to the industrial, for instance. Some strains became yellow when you sold them, to sell them in a supermarket. And so other strains do not become yellow, but they have... Uh, uh, not that appealing aroma, and you cannot cause them to generate uh, some strain that would have both. And so um, we also studied another mold, so the, the Penicium camemberti, and so it's about the same story actually. So they acquire the same uh, horizontal gene transfer. So the, you can see here from an old picture uh, drawing and a picture, actually the brie uh, used to be blue. And it's only very recently that we selected a, a white strain. And again, it's only one, one clonal lineages with one genotype, one strain used to make all the brie and camembert worldwide. worldwide. And here, the PDO actually increases deleterious effect because we have to use, to be called camembert or brie, we have to use this single strain. We cannot use another strain. So actually here, the PDO um, threaten diversity instead of protecting it. And again, to so we reconstruct the history um, of this Penicium camemberti strains, and we had actually sequential, sequential domestication steps. So from the like an ancestral-like uh, population uh, growing uh, spoiling uh, vegetables. So we had a third step with a, a bottleneck, giving a Penicium biforme, still grey, um, but and still with some diversity, and then these clonal lineages of uh, Penicium camemberti with just one clone and white. And you can see here uh, above the, the, the white that also grow uh, more vertically. And so again, we found uh, a beneficial trait. So the, the, the different steps of domestication, it became whiter and whiter with higher competitive ability, faster growth on cheese. But on the other hand, it also lost the ability of sexual reproduction, he lost the ability to grow on a harsh condition, and now he's degenerating to the point that he cannot produce spore anymore, so, so the industrial really have a hard time to produce spore to sell them to inoculate the cheese. So it really pose a problem, and we cannot cause them to generate, generate more variability. So at the conclusion, so we found multiple independent adaptation events of Penicium fungi to cheese with convergent phenotypic adaptation. So the same traits evolved repeatedly, the growth competition, toxin loss, sex loss, and the adaptation occur in part by the very same horizontal gene transfer, the same genes transfers, but we found strong bottlenecks, strong degeneration, and the fact that PDO can protect or threaten genetic diversity. And to conclude and come back to the beginning, so that's really come back uh, to the idea of Fabilov and to general loss of diversity in domesticated organisms that it's not specific to fungi, it's in all the crops. We, we, we are uh, losing diversity uh, at a uh, rapid pace and it really poses problems for the sustainable use of uh, the domesticated organism. And, and we should really see this biodiversity as a dynamic process where we need to keep this, uh, the possibility for this um, dynamic and evolution and not see the, the conservation as a static process to conserve what exists, but really conserve the dynamics that the law uh, to evolve uh, the, and, and adapt to the changing environment. Thank you.
Thanks very much. Um, we have two little questions that have arrived since we have two minutes left. Oops, one. Um, which says that humans change selection pressures radically, uh, but do they change them in a predictable manner? Uh, at least like in natural ecosystems or not? Yeah, um, so that's a big question. Maybe for the discussion, uh, yeah, I guess some some of the aspects can be predictable, uh, others maybe not. And the issue, the issue is that uh, they, um, yeah, as you know, ecosystem are so complex, are so complex that uh, even if the selection pressure maybe is predictable, the ans the response of the organism are not. So I'm not sure it can help. Thanks. There's apparently a consensus that uh, evolution is hard to predict. Um, so can we just have Emmanuel's talk now? Um, we're really on schedule. Emmanuel Millot is from the University of Trois-Rivières in Montreal, and his talk is called Evolutionary Potential or Evolutionary No Future. OK. Uh, thank you. So uh, in the talk we just had before, I think that these talk really show how critical it is to uh, account for evolu evolutionary processes uh, for the conservation of biodiversity. Uh, and what I, I'm going to talk about is more about how the scientists themselves perceive uh, the way they should do that, in a sense. And uh, I will uh, focus uh, on this idea that is uh, quite widespread in evolutionary conservation, although it's not all evolutionary conservation. So it's this idea to um, conserve evolutionary potential. Uh, <clears throat> what I I'll be talking about today uh, is uh, presented in a paper that we did with Arnaud Béchet and uh, Virginie Maris uh, um, uh, that we published last year. So you will uh, have uh, this idea there. It's really a, a thought and discussion that we had uh, we wanted to step back a little bit and look at maybe at the wider picture of, you know, uh, when we are interested in conservation as scientists, often we, we, we are in a hurry. We, we want to get results and, uh, you know, start to, uh, to, to understand more uh, the, the biological systems to, to be able to, to help their preservation. But uh, sometimes it's good to step back and wonder about the you know, the meaning of what we do. And uh, some idea also comes from, uh, unfortunately, it's not in, in a translated in English, but the Virginie's book, uh, Philosophy de la Biodiversité. So <clears throat> when uh, we uh, think about uh, conservation of biodiversity and the role uh, of evolution, uh, they are, we could say, two major uh, epistemic intuition or moral intuition behind this idea to link, uh, you know, uh, concern for evolution uh, with uh, biological conservation. So, first, uh, biodiver the biodiversity generating process perspective, uh, well, it's the idea that evolution uh, is the diverse process that has uh, shaped uh, the actual biodiversity. Thus, protecting this process is a way to maintain the capacity of biodiversity to evolve. The other intuition is, uh, we call it biodiversity pattern perspective. So uh, evolution is the adaptation process by which biological entities uh, respond to new selective pressure uh, so conserving this adaptation process, it's also a way to allow bio, biological entities to persist through times. So the big question is, do these two intuitions converge toward the same goal? And can we uh, derive meaningful prescription from this concept of evolutionary potential? And the <clears throat> the problem uh, is uh, manifold. So first, well, in our opinion, you may disagree, but uh, evolutionary potential, as, you know, as important as it is, has also become a sort of, of catch-all concept. 
So you will find, for example, study where uh, the link between the mechanistic link between evolutionary potential uh, and uh, conservation is very clear. You will find other instances where, uh, you know, which I call more uh, romantic view of evolutionary potential, where, you know, we have these uh, results. So, uh, well, uh, based on this, uh, we should do that to preserve evolutionary potential. But what evolution, evolution, evolutionary potential, sorry, uh, it's not always clear. And the problem is that sometimes uh, there are conflicts over conservation goals that are not made explicit or even not perceived when we evoke uh, this kind of thing in evolutionary conservation. Also, uh, the role of scientists in defining these goals is somewhat ill-defined. It's not specific to evolutionary conservation, but I think that especially with the conservation of evolutionary potential, uh, we see this, the, this this thing maybe more uh, obviously. And this is maybe a, you know, a simplification and maybe abusive, but we have to think also, why are we doing all this while Amazonia is burning? So the idea here is, you know, can we keep in mind also the emergency we have to address at different levels? Uh, <clears throat> so what we, uh, with my co-author, we, we had this uh, you know, reflection where we came out with four dimensions of evolutionary potential that we think uh, that people that you know, evoke conservation of evolutionary potential should address uh, to cl clarify what they mean. And the first dimension are the vehicle. So what biological entity uh, will be able, should be able to evolve. And <clears throat> before uh, going into the, this first dimension, we need some definition of ev evolutionary potential. And there are not one kind of evolutionary potential. There are many, many different kinds, uh, depending on the different level of biological organization. Uh, depending if you think about pattern or function, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we want to link conservation value and goal to science, well, we we chose a, a definition that is broader and that can make that link uh, for different view of conservation. So we define evolutionary potential as the property of a, a biological entity to be able to experience an irritable, irritable change in some of its component between times t and times t plus delta t. And this, uh, uh, this time interval is important to, to remind here. So it's very broad. It's not very explicit. But uh, it is also because we uh, are not uh, doing only fundamental science. We want to uh, be able to uh, do things that will help uh, conservation. So one of some of the uh, advantage of this oper um, operational definition is that it will, as you will see, I expect, clarify what we expect from the objective of conserving evolutionary potential and avoid some circularity in evolutionary conservation in the sense that uh, when people do research, they will refine their understanding of evolutionary process and the concept of evolutionary potential. And they will feed and you know, propose conservation objective that will again uh, orientate research and so forth. But the danger of this is to go towards what some have called a discovery-oriented conservation, or uh, what I call techno-scientific uh, headlong rush. So uh, in French, would be a fruit en um, In a sense that it's not, especially in the area of genomic, in, not that this is bad, uh, that you know, conservation genetic and genomic is bad, but uh, we uh, must be aware that if we, you know, uh, the more we know, 
uh, and the more we tend to, you know, define our conservation priority uh, based uh, on these extra detail that we accumulate. Okay. So uh, we define the vehicle of evolutionary potential as the biological entity whose capacity to evolve is required for the realization of conservation objective. This is where we make the link, all right? So, uh, uh, and I just put, uh, you know, uh, a list of what could be vehicle of evolutionary potential. And to identify those vehicles, it's not only a scientific question. This is why we link these vehicles to conservation right in the definition. Because depending on you know, the conservation goal, uh, you will have to select the appropriate vehicle uh, that will uh, be able to evolve or have present some evolutionary potential to meet this goal. And uh, as we will see with an example, different uh, conservation priority may mean that we should focus on different vehicles, and also this can lead to conflicting prescription. That's why uh, we, we need to think to this thing. So as an example, these two warbler species, they, they breed in North America, and uh, to make a, a long story short, uh, when, uh, you know, due to the colonization, agricultural colonization of America, and then, you know, uh, secondary succession when uh, part of the land wa was abandoned, uh, these two species, the golden wing and blue wing wobbler, they, they start to interbreed uh, in the area that is uh, that you see uh, in green, or maybe black, uh, it's, it's quite the, the dark area. And they, they interbreed, and uh, you, you find a, a different uh, you know, type of hybrid and uh, back rust and so forth uh, plumage. Um, so this is a phenomenon that is that has been known for a while, and this civilization they, it favors uh, the blue wing wobbler. Uh, so this system uh, has been well studied. I just put a uh, uh, name a few of these study, and what happened in short is that the female of both species and even hybrid female prefer to mate with the golden wing wobbler. And the fitness of hybrid is and back rust and so forth are, is comparable to the f fitness of purebred. So there's some genetic dilution, if, if you want, of uh, the golden wing wobbler by the blue wing wobbler. And the pure golden wing uh, wobbler disappear after a few decades of hybridization. This has been observed in, in a few places. So, and there is in North America uh, a lot of concern about this and people uh, wondering how we can, you know, protect these two species and conserve the evolutionary potential. But if you think about it, and I'm not, uh, the, the, we can see the, the situation uh, from two angles. So from a more fixist angle, we could think that we should conserve the evolutionary potential within each species so that we conserve both species on the long run. But we could also consider that uh, we should conserve uh, the, uh, that this hybridation uh, indeed um, will allow to conserve, you know, at the community level, some wobbler population, maybe not two species, maybe a one species or uh, um, uh, kind of hybrid species that is adapted to the new condition. I'm not saying that one option is good and the other is, is bad. Uh, I'm just asking the question, uh, you know, um, uh, we, when we talk about the evolutionary potential, we, this may mean very, very different things. In the first case, the vehicle would be the, you know, the traits, for example, uh, that allow adaptation. And in the second case, the, the vehicle could be the species themselves that could change to 
may, to, uh, so that the community, some community may, may continue to exist with some diversity. Uh, so we, we cannot if avoid some, some trade-off when we put that all together. I'm, I'll go a bit faster here because uh, I think uh, time is uh, running. But uh, <clears throat> I want to say that uh, one concept that is very, very uh, common in, in evolutionary conservation is the ESU, evolutionary significant unit, units. And when you start to think about ESU and conservation of evolutionary potential, the link between the two is not straightforward at all. Uh, it would be long a bit to explain, so I'm a bit surfing on, on the ideas here, but uh, you know, we can discuss that afterwards. Uh, also, you know, the focus on genetic diversity uh, within taxa uh, can also be uh, a problem, a problem uh, to, uh, depending on you know, the conservation vision that we, uh, for, for which we, we, we work. And um, genetic diversity is seen as the evolutionary potential uh, very, very often. But may, are we choosing the right vehicle? It depends what we want to do. So this brings me to the second dimension is the temporality of evolutionary potential. And curiously, although uh, it's implicit that when we talk about evolutionary conservation, there is a temporal dimension. But it's really uh, discuss explicitly in papers that discuss the conservation of evolutionary potential. And so let's uh, consider the time uh, earlier I mentioned the interval from time t, that could be now, for example, to time t plus delta t in, in the future. So imagine that the conservation goal is for the future would be, you know, to have the system, uh, you know, the biodiversity or the uh, on Earth, uh, with some, you know, uh, to conserve, you know, some property of this uh, or some level of this biodiversity uh, over this all interval, so uh, that you know we achieve conservation uh, of, of this biodiversity. But if there is no evolutionary potential, maybe we won't be able, over this interval, to, uh, to, to conserve the biodiversity that we want. And that would be uh, the opposite if there is some evolutionary potential that exists uh, so that, over that interval, the uh, species, ecosystem, or, or whatever can uh, adapt to the condition that they will uh, encounter. So this raised the point that when we want to conserve evolutionary potential, we must think that there should be potential for an evolutionary change at a temporal scale that is consistent with conservation objective. So just saying that this population has a lower genetic diversity than this other, there's no temporal consideration in this. Uh, you, if we you know, think that, OK, we should, uh, for example, increase the diversity there, we need also to, uh, to, to understand why we want to do it at what temporal scale. Uh, so again, a few examples of uh, temporality that could be uh, considered. And the question is, can we predict also evolutionary change at the relevant time scale? And this has been evoked in the earlier presentation. And can we realistically undertake action that could be effective on that time scale? It may be that conserving evolutionary potential would be very great, but we cannot just do it in a way that uh, we, we should to con uh, achieve uh, uh, or conservation objective. Uh, it also implies to anticipate not only environmental changes, but what are the appropriate evolutionary response given some postulated evolutionary potential of them T. Uh, and the other question is uh, that 
start to emerge from the literature is, you know, should we conserve evolutionary potential or should we use it? Because some proposition are to select right now, for example, the some individuals, so the select the winner, for example, the idea, uh, mean that we we have some evolutionary potential in natural population and we we use it. But if we use it, we will have an effect and you know that we can predict maybe o over some time scale, but we could have another effect at a longer time scale that we you know that may or may not match conservation objective. And we need to think about uh, not only the evolutionary potential right now when we find ways to conserve it, but uh, what's going to happen to this potential. This is not a fixed thing. Because if evolutionary potential were never expressed, there would be no point to conserve it. So we must consider two other things, which are the expression of evolutionary potential in the future, so which is we call the transformation of this potential that initially exists into a readable modification of the vehicle. So for example, the you know the, the most obvious example is you know um, natural selection that will, for example, uh, change a trait. And you could have also you you have to think also about the transfer of evolutionary potential because uh, this potential uh, that you look at some biological level can mean something else or can be even transferred from one biological level to another. If I go back to this mm -hmm. example. Oh, Okay, this example of wobblers. Well, uh, when they hybridize, they transfer uh, some of the evolutionary potential, if we may say, uh, of a, of the, 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 a vehicle which is uh, uh, at a higher level that may uh, be the one that will ensure the maintenance of a, of a community. Okay, uh, I will go fast on uh, on this, but uh, there is also uh, the problem of genetic essentialism, which uh, is, to some extent, we can come back in the discussion on that, but uh, almost de de denies the role of evolutionary potential in, in, in conservation. And uh, the two other dimension uh, that uh, I want to present is the measurability. So. Uh, we need to ask the right question to identify the appropriate evolutionary potential metrics. Okay, so that means we need to identify the right vehicle. We need to have considered temporality, uh, the potential dynamic of evolutionary potential, and uh, this is important to uh, determine if uh, we should choose genetic diversity or measure genetic diversity or something else that way or that way as the uh, best measure of evolutionary potential for the problem at stake. And ultimately, measurability should be about also evaluate the probability of different evolutionary outcomes. Some outcomes might be more desirable uh, than, than other. So uh, this is what we, we, we want to inform to some extent when we choose how to measure evolutionary potential. Uh, I'll go over this, uh, I put maybe a bit too much. So uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to finish with the naturalness, the fourth dimension. So that's a huge debate. We cannot uh, you know, uh, solve this debate today, but there's also a difference between naturalness and wilderness. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing. But uh, conservation of evolutionary potential uh, project us in a future uh, where the biodiversity will evolve into new states. And these states can approach or go away from some natural reference point. Another question is when we refer to naturalness, we need to think, is it the naturalness of the biological entity that we want to keep, or do, you, do we want evolutionary potential and it to be itself natural or we want to 
uh, 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 play directly on, on this potential. So many, many questions that, that are raised. And key example that I've been uh, discussed uh, partly today is uh, hybridization and urban habitat, which are every, uh, extremely important uh, today because hybridization uh, is, of course, occurring between many species, and there's a debate about whether it's good or when it's good, when it's not. And urban habitat are uh, everywhere now, and I think... Uh, so I just put a few references uh, about this year, and since Anne, uh, well, Anne didn't want to present her work, but <laughs> the, the, the book at the right is, is uh, she's a co-editor on, on this book. So uh, in conclusion, why scientists should address the four dimension of evolutionary potential? Why we suggest this? We suggest this first so they can make explicit their normative commitment. So the conservation goal underlying their work, they also may, uh, this may help to target the appropriate vehicle relevant to this goal, and also to identify the limits of their proposal. So it's nice to say we should conserve evolutionary potential, but can we measure it in the relevant way? Does the, uh, is this coming in conflict with other proposal and, and so forth? Uh, and also, it's, I'm not saying that everyone should decide, you know, of its own vision. You can present your own vision, but you you can also uh, this can also help to show where your work uh, lies within uh, uh, relative to value that are. Uh, that have a wider, wider acceptance in the society. This will not be easy, but these are matters to, to think. Uh, so, oh, oh, sorry. So I'll, I'll stop here. And last slide. Uh, no. thank, thank you, and let's debate. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was a really interesting talk. It's always great to see concepts uh, that everybody uses without paying too much attention, being really taken apart, and the values in them being discussed. That's really interesting. Um, so now we have a 20-minute break. I know you've been waiting for it. Um, so we, we, we are back here um, in 20 minutes. Please use that time to send any questions that you have left in some corner of your brain. Um, we're uh, we're waiting for them, and uh, I look forward to the global discussion that we're going to have.
venir, etc. Allô We're going, we're going to restart, so please be seated. Um, the discussion is going to begin very, very soon, hopefully. So um, we're, we're going to restart this session. Thank you for still being there. Uh, and thank you for all the people online for still being there. Uh, we have a batch of questions here that we have received uh, through, um, through the session. So we're going to go through them. I, I will read them one by one and see um, with the speakers uh, who they're aimed at. Uh, the others can jump in if they wish to. Uh, we're going to try and keep all this lively, and short answers are always hopefully better than long ones. Um, the audience can ask questions. If, if at some point you, you want to jump in, just raise your hand. We'll try and find a way to mix this in and uh, to discuss all together. Um, my first question that we have received is sort of vaguely aimed at Peter and Francois, but as I said, others can answer too. And um, the, the listener said uh, the following thing. I thought the egocentric agenda was more meant to avoid governing everything. To, it was meant to promote more spontaneous dynamics in place of any sort of stewardship or anything. So do we, do we want stewardship or do we want spontaneity? Uh, yeah, I can try and answer that. Uh, I'm sorry if if you hear uh, uh, there's my uh, my son in the background, but um, he's fine. Um, so uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I think that's a good point, and it raises. I mean, it, it it goes directly to the conundrum of the Anthropocene. I I would say the point is it's it's hard to have any spontaneity. Um, if you don't consciously uh, govern for it. So if you don't consciously allow a space for it, um, even that. So it becomes more of a semantics. Um, I think you can't avoid having spontaneity in evolution, right? Um, every time we have kids, every time a bacteria reproduces, point mutation, whatever, that's spontaneity. Uh, I guess you could see it like that, and then you can have more or less of it. But, but certainly creating more space for what we might call less human uh, altered nature um, will allow some types of that spontaneity, but uh, yeah, in the urban areas, it's a completely different thing, right? It's another kind of uh, spontaneity there. So yes, we want, I, I think um, that's spontaneity is the point of the centric agenda, correct me if I'm wrong, Francois, uh, but um, you do need to be very deliberate about it, I think. 
but Peter, don't you think that, as we've all said, that evolution is very unpredictable? Uh, it, it's hard to decide to govern it? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think you can govern. Uh, so when you, when I mean governance is that then it's basically human decision making and that will influence uh, people no matter what. So someone will not be able to build there or, or so on. So, so, uh, so of course you cannot govern evolution down to the minute detail. That's uh, not at all the point, I think. Uh, okay, Francois? Yeah, I think, I think this is typically uh, the kind of question that could be raised also uh, during the last uh, session that we will have uh, on ethics uh, the, the, on, on Friday. But um, to, to, to my view, this matter of uh, having this uh, kind of evocentric framework is just to at least uh, allow to identify this kind of question <laughs> in the agenda and also to, to, to once again discuss the fact that uh, our matter of governance, when we discuss the governance of life forms, is uh, at first a matter of governance of our own uh, behaviors, of our own decisions, of our own uh, uh, social uh, uh, trajectories, uh, with all the justice and uh, uh, democracy uh, level of constraint, which is <laughs> of course very positive constraint to my uh, from to my view. Um, uh, about this uh, matter of governance, but the fact is that in, in, in our in the semantic of conservation, clearly there is some kind of uh, 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 gradient from governance of uh, among humans, with humans, for humans, including uh, consequences on biodiversity and the governance of biodiversity itself. Uh, and uh, when you account for, for for evolution in these discussions, you can consider that. Even if you want it, it will be extremely unpredictable. So, so uh, even from a practical point of view, uh, expecting to govern anything in biodiversity is simply a nightmare. And, and uh, well, I'm, I'm a bit provocative at the beginning of the round table, but I think that uh, uh, by, uh, in some way, uh, putting evolution in the in the discussion in the agenda, uh, at least from a practical point of view, is likely to 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 lead uh, lead us to some kind of uh, humility or, or modesty in in the way we discuss about this matter of governing biodiversity. Okay, uh, we we have another question which is sort of close to this one, um, and it asks: Would you consider even more biotic governance uh, to be a positive ecocentric value? I guess the answer would be. Uh, according to what what I said just before, I think to 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 my view, uh, well, th th there is a big difference between uh, what I can say as a scientist asking question and trying to to answer part of them uh, and see uh, uh, positive, and what I can say as a as a simple citizen. And I think that my point of view as a citizen today is not the most important thing for this one table. I think this is my point of view as a scientist, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, uh, this. Uh, kind of egocentric approach is once again uh, the idea to focus on reducing our impact on evolutionary trajectories and we will discuss that later on with uh, the point that was raised by uh, Emmanuel and, and other uh, speaker about the way we consider evolution as a constraint for conservation objectives or the way we could also put evolution into or re restore it into the definition of the conservation objective. And in that case, it changed the, the way we will consider this uh, matter of governance, this matter of uh, uh, evolution uh, into this. Uh, is it, is it a, a, an element of the landscape or is it also among the ultimate aims of conservation? Okay. Maybe we can move on to several questions we actually have for Emmanuel Porcher, but the others feel free to express yourselves. Um, we've been asked if we could quantify human-mediated speciation rates. Can we say something about that? Uh, yes, there are quantifications. Uh, I was quick during my presentation, but um, the work by Chris Thomas on plants, for example, he has uh, quantified the number of new species in several plant groups 
and I can't recall the exact number from the top of my head, but um, there are like several orders of magnitudes above the background speciation rate. Okay, amazing. Um, following up on that, uh, we've been asked whether um, the present anthropogenic rapid extinction, uh, for example, in case of a society collapse, um, would that allow many species to emerge and therefore possibly have a positive influence on diversity? I'm not sure I got this question. Can you say it again? Yeah. The, basically, the question is, uh, in this period of rapid extinction, does uh -huh. that sort of open up opportunities? And could it have a positive influence on diversity? Uh, OK. I, I don't think it. Well, depends on what you assume as a starting point. But if we consider that we started from a point where uh, pretty much all uh, niches available were uh, occupied, um, then the current high rate of extinction may uh, be freeing some niches that would leave opportunities for uh, new species to uh, emerge and occupy them, provided that human activities uh, leave them the opportunity to do so. But that will not result in a higher diversity um, than, than, than before the human gives that my thought. Sure. May I complete? Uh, yeah, please do. On, on this. Uh, and I would say that uh, in this case, we are not in the realm of conservation anymore. So, of course, we could uh, uh, do nothing at all. This full of evolutionary potential uh, uh, that still exists, even though we stop, you know, worry about, uh, you know, conservation. But in this case, my understanding, I don't know the details, uh, is that we are not in the you know, the area of conservation of biodiversity anymore if we are going to allow, uh, you know, uh, extension to boost uh, the diversification after. Right. Um, and one last question. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Wait. So Go ahead. If, if I got right, the idea is that, uh, so extension will be good because then it will allow diversification, but extension in the first place occurs because the niche does not exist anymore, right? If there is no niche uh, to fill in. So I think that may be a dangerous idea for the conservation because it, it may think that it, it can be restored, but... Uh, I, I suspect that the argument for, uh, for some uh, author or, co or commentators about that is that uh, there remains some kind of niche, but a different niche that that's the niche that led to the to the extinction. Yeah, but, but that's not the answer linked to the extinction. Then. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the the the, um, the the argument is also a, a matter of time scale. I think that uh, Emmanuel wanted to to, to yeah. talk about that. But uh, uh, clearly, when we hear something about the fact that well, uh, no problem. This is not biodiversity that is uh, uh, threatened, but is only humans. In fact, by the end. The fact is that we are losing life forms and we are shaping life forms and we are saying not only how numerous they should be, how uh, where they should be, but we are saying what they should be in their traits, in their life cycle, in their, in their forms. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the, the, the major issue of what, what about conservation is. What, what are we ready to tolerate, to, to live with uh, in the face of Earth? So, so, so you, you, I think you are totally right that... Uh, um, the, the, the idea of replacing ex extinct species by uh, new radiation uh, is, uh, is not, from that point of view, uh, directly acceptable. And, and yeah, I, I also think the idea behind it is that sort of evolution will fix itself, you know. I mean, yeah. the, the biosphere will fix itself, and, and obviously that's not working very well. <laughs> well in, in the very long term, uh, evolution will restore diversity, it's, it's most likely, but it's going to be something different than what we would have without the impact of humans. Yeah, and I s also the time scale matters. I mean, in the long term, uh, we'll all be dead, as somebody said uh, rightly. Um, uh, one last question for you, Emmanuel, which is um, the following. Macroevolution results from series 
of microevolutionary events. But humans accelerate the turnover of these microevents somehow. Uh, how can organisms cope with that? Can they cope with that? So the question is whether humans will accelerate the um, microevolutionary events. Uh, yes, in a way, uh, probably because they will increase the strengths of selection on certain aspects. They can increase mutation rates uh, via pollution, for example. And um, whether uh, organisms can cope with that is really a broad question. It's Question, and I'm not sure I can answer. Mm -hmm. If somebody else has something to give this help. Yeah, I, I guess I can give a, um, a compliment of answer uh, since this. Please speak close to the mic. Okay. Um, since this is linked to some examples I've shown on microevolution, and for example, I guess I was focused on. Uh, kind of giving uh, samples of uh, situations where organisms have coped with these uh, drastic changes, and the killifish example is one, but I did not mention, or perhaps too briefly, that most of the other fishes did not cope. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess the answer here is that yes, um, um, it Good is point. a pervasive idea that uh, humans are inducing um, new forces of selection that should lead to a stronger, faster selection. But in most cases, the first consequence is, is, is a decline because the ad adaptation is not rapid enough. This is true for climate change. This is true for most of the changes that are just too rapid for adaptation to occur. So yes, it can happen, but most of the time it's just going to be a decline and disappearance of the, of the species. So, since you have the microphone, there's a question for you, which is very simple. Penicillium versus guppies. Who wins in a changing climate? Uh, uh, who versus guppies, sorry? <laughs> Penicillium. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's also for Tatiana, <laughs> right. <laughs> this is for Tatiana, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a competition with yeah. between us two, or? <laughs> well, I think Fungi wins, right? <laughs> That's obvious. <laughs> I guess the key um, answer lies in the generation time. So it's basically what I said before, that um, um, it's, it's a matter of how rapid the populations can adapt in response to the changes. And as regard uh, changes induced by humans, they are all very rapid. And so if this is probably why, you know, I work on birds, but I didn't give you any example on birds because they lose uh, <laughs> when they're facing mosquitoes, which have a much faster generation time. So definitely penicilliums. Do you want to react? To but not the domesticated ones. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I mean, this is also about uh, the fact that we're in a crisis, right? And uh, in the crisis, the, the fast evolving organisms are probably the ones that fare the best. And the others necessarily lose, I guess. Or am I wrong? Th they are already the most numerous in terms of biomass, for example. Right. Terms of at the biosphere level, of course, where there is far more uh, biomass of uh, bacteria, viruses, etc., than uh, than uh, animals and uh, and big ones or big okay. trees. And uh, trees, it's, uh, it's different because in terms of biomass, they represent a lot. But uh, but so uh, th there is also this matter of, uh, as you said, of generation time, which is absolutely central to this question and. And for example, if we consider that uh, one of the very old olive trees that knew Alexander the Great <laughs> just uh, uh, died uh, days ago due to uh, the last uh, fires in the Mediterranean, uh, exemplifies the fact that there are some organisms that have been there for uh, thousands of years in themselves as an, as an individual, and they are facing in the, at the level of their own life all these changes. So, so. Uh, it's it's very important to, to, to keep in mind that uh, our view as human lives, give, uh, our our point of view, sorry, from from human uh, point of view, is uh, give us a, a, um, a very biased view about what can be this uh, selective pressure for other life forms in terms of dynamics, in terms of uh, time scales. Yeah, I guess time scales are super important. Can I? Uh, 
add something as well? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Peter, please. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of uh, also expanding this uh, um, and to give Anne a bit of support for the birds. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about domains of, of evolution. Of course, we, we know there are some birds that fare extremely well um, because they have a huge capacity to learn and I guess may are even good examples of uh, uh, cumulative co cultural evolution as sm at smaller scales. Um, so, so not at uh, similar rates of accumulation as, as we humans have, but corvids, for example, or gulls and, and things like that are extremely behaviorally flexible. And I think can also, but Anne, you may know this better than me in some cases, transfer some of these burn behaviors. So, so that's, of course, the other um, uh, at the phenotypic level and, and approaching the level of, of culture, uh, the other way to survive um, if you have, if you don't have a super rapid generation time or large population size. Yeah, I completely agree with this comment. And uh, there, there, there was a publication last uh, month about um, uh, behaviors of cuckoos in Australia that have learned to open uh, human bins. And they've showed how um, this behavior emerged in one neighborhood of Sydney uh, but then uh, there was culture, cultural spread of this behavior, which allowed the birds to actually thrive in the city because they, they, they now all know how to open the bins. And actually, in the face of the um, crisis, and I just want to come back to this crisis term that you used, uh, um, uh, but the COVID crisis, I think uh, we have, as humans, a long generation time and the COVID has very short generation time. So presently we could say that we're losing because they're uh, evolving much more rapidly than we are. But perhaps for us, one solution is this cultural evolution and the change in behavior is one of them um, that needs to spread and, and counter the evolution, genetic evolution of the, the um, COVID. And just to come back to this crisis, because you, you mentioned that um, you know, this is particularly the case because we are in a crisis where the changes are so rapid. And I just want to say there was this remark in the last book of one of my mentors, Jacques Blondel, uh, who mentioned that we're actually not in a crisis. We are in a transition because um, a crisis is something that happens and then disappears. But for many of the anthropogenic uh, changes that we observe, uh, we're not in a situation where we can expect tomorrow to be better. Uh, so it's not a crisis in the sense that it's going to be gone tomorrow. It's really a transition to the next world. Right. I, I use crisis in the sense of acceleration. I mean, really rapid uh, yeah, yeah. succession of events. It wasn't really right. a criticism because I use the same term, but reading that book made me realize that uh, perhaps our view, especially on how evolution plays out in, in biodiversity future, uh, perhaps should take this transition kind of aspect into account. Yep. Um, yeah, there was a comment on this last discussion point, which said that phenotypic plasticity level can also help organisms with long generation time to cope, which I guess is true. Um, OK, uh, another question for Anne. Uh, it's the last one I have. Uh, and it's on the matter of spatial scale and reproductive traits um, that you mentioned. How do we account for that? Um, not sure. I, do you know what this refers to? I'm not sure whether it refers to the mosquito examples where I mentioned that they uh, changed their reproductive behavior because of the scale uh, in the genetic and the, the connectedness between the different. I, I don't know, but uh, certainly in our studies of, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question with, because I'm not sure I understand it. <laughs> so they might, the person might want to rephrase it if they want. Uh, but um, it is certainly true that the scale issue in the city is of paramount importance uh, because the scale that matters is going to be the scale that uh, compares to the dispersal of the species we're studying. And so across different taxa, we're going to have to look at the city. And I'm talking about the city because th my talk was about it, but it's true for many other anthropogenic changes. Um, and so we have to look at the city at the scale that matters for the taxa the, that we consider, uh, because uh, things like gene flow will obviously matter on the scale. And this is 
um, in a way, it complexifies our job when we want to predict evolution. We have to find the right scale. So that means that we first have to have very good knowledge about the biology of the species uh, to understand the scale at which uh, we're, we're studying the species. Uh, so it's important for the reproduction, that's what the, the person mentioned, but it's, it's important for evolution of any trait, I would say. I mean, f from a journalistic point of view, it's striking that um, uh, you hear very contradictory things about connectivity, for example. Like uh, people say, okay, we need connectivity for evolution. And then people will say, no, but uh, if you connect, then you dilute uh, and, and then and that it's the opposite. So I guess it's organism by organism, right? Yeah, exactly, plus the fact that um, if you connect, you create bridges, for example, uh, for the frog species I showed in my example, uh, you know, the, the, this bridge will work for, for the um, amphibians, but it's completely not gonna work for birds, which can connect via air, but they need uh, also other favorable environments. So, um, it's very interesting for me as an evolutionary biologist to try and connect with urban planning because you know the the um, urban planning people will come and see me and say, okay, what do you advise that we do with our um, green areas in this or this city? And actually, it all depends on the on the species view you you have. So it's um, I think Frank has something to say here. No, no. No, I just wanted to say that even within species, you can have positive aspects of connectivity and negative aspects. So, for for example, uh, you you can you can increase uh, I don't know uh, the the spread of benefit genes and also increase uh, disease spread or uh, uh, any other aspect. So w even within a population or within a species, th there can be the two aspects. But I will just add that evolution is not necessarily ab only about positive aspects. I mean, uh, evolution, uh, accepting some kind of free evolution is also accepting extinction. It's accepting selective pressure, uh, 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 elimination of uh, some uh, uh, individuals, etc. So it's it's also difficult for some people to accept that by thinking in terms of evolution for non-human organisms. Uh, you, you accept positive and negative, uh, what we could call some kind of perceive as negative aspects of evolution. Uh, and, and so this is more about, I, th I, I would think or, or ask the question, it's more about uh, how we could reduce our own selective pressure on the system instead of trying to organism per organism, population per population, trying to optimize uh, the selective context for that population. Mm. The idea would be perhaps, it's probably uh, in simply uh, impossible to, to list all what should be done for a given uh, area to, to try to save everything. But we can perhaps try to work on trying to reduce what are the potentially negative impacts of what we, we are doing. So it's probably more a matter of precautionary uh, <laughs> principle, which is also a lot uh, largely discussed uh, another way. Perhaps in, uh, for yeah. domestic things, it's probably a, a bit different because we, we can probably drive or, or, or act more accurately. But, um. Actually, the, that's what I, I was trying to say in my talk about conserving the, the dynamics. Uh, it's indeed, uh, you, you don't uh, want to conserve the species as they are and just stop them evolving and conserve them like that. It's just conserving the habitats, uh, the, 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 possibility, the possibility to evolve and, yeah. Emmanuel wanted to say something, yeah. Yeah, uh, so... Emmanuel. Ah, yeah. <laughs> both, both Emmanuel. Sorry, no, sorry, go ahead, Emmanuel. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, I totally agree uh, with Fra uh, what Francois said. Uh, the, this come back to the question, uh, you know, uh, and, and also Frank, um, how do we manage all this? Because uh, you know we we can try to do fine tuning per species per population. Well, uh, in the end, I don't know what will be the result. But I need I think that it's a little bit like uh, if you take uh, a bunch of conservation genetic papers and you say, okay, I'm going to apply all these recommendations that is that are in the last paragraph of every single population genetic paper on every single population or species. You will end up protecting poorly not much. So, uh, and, and I think that this raised the point that uh, this knowledge evolutionary conservation, uh, including in urban habitat, 
is important to uh, you know extract principles to uh, uh, to manage things or to to take decision, and maybe uh, so we, we maybe the, we should look a bit less at that species. We can use a species or population to to you know address this question, but maybe not try to tailor each recommendation to each single species that uh, that we study. Okay, thanks. So we have Emmanuel, and then Peter wants to say something. Mm, yeah, I wanted to come back to the um, connectivity issue. So maybe if Peter wants to carry on, on on the current topic, which was much broader. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. You were first. Yeah, yeah. regarding uh, connectivity, uh, when you uh, isolate large populations, uh, that may create opportunity for local adaptation and perhaps on a long term emergence of new species. And with a um, normative postulate that diversity is good, then that's good to have isolation. But in contrast, when you create isolation uh, of small populations that are already impacted by exploitation, pollution, and whatnot, uh, then that increases their uh, probability of, uh, of uh, extinction. And, and that's bad from the, uh, the perspective of maintaining diversity. So it really depends on also the initial state that you consider. OK, thanks. Peter. Yeah, I, I was uh, intrigued by Anne's comment about uh, problems engaging with urban planners. Um, so I, I, uh, I haven't engaged with urban planners, but I've engaged with um, <clears throat> a lot of medical scientists and um, agronomists um, trying to eradicate various species um, or seeing that as their primary objective. And then uh, trying to open up for uh, more biosphere-based inquiry uh, or scientific-based scientific biosphere based frameworks for inquiry can be, can be quite difficult. And this uh, I, I can certainly let you know that this egocentric approach will be very, at first point, very provocative to any medical doctor who has seen a person die in an intensive care unit due to, you know, uh, a pathogen that horizontally some hundred years ago maybe got transmitted a resistance gene from a otherwise very interesting free living soil microorganism. So, so this brings uh, two points I wanted to make was that. Uh, and don't give up because actually with time, I think uh, there we create mutual understanding and we as scientists learn, we may maybe ask new questions or uh, adjust frameworks or innovate frameworks to fit uh, the context of urban, urban planners. And, and I think even urban planners and or whether they're ICU medical doctors and so on, they they actually, with time, also open up their um, their horizons uh, for new types of inquiry. But then we, I think, it's very important that we as scientists understand that there are myriad uh, types of ethics uh, out there uh, in the world, and we all live in very different environments. So how we think about evolution may be very difficult. Uh, different uh, from people living in a in a emerging disease uh, risk hotspot, for example, um, and and they may be completely unreceptive to some of our ways of arguing about evolution um, and ethics, of course. So, so just to make those two points about long-term engagement uh, with practitioners and and also us as scientists not imposing our ethics, but yeah, trying yeah. to understand ethics. Yeah, it's amazing how you hit ethics and values very quickly when you talk about conservation. Um, it's not just pure science by far. Yeah, and I, I think it comes back to the, the fact that ethics are a product of, of cultural evolution. And as we sit here, we are uh, actually ourselves receptive to microevolutionary processes of cultural evolution. And tomorrow our thinking will be different, uh, maybe. Uh, at best, <laughs> and maybe improved even, who knows. Um, so, and I think that's that was what I found so intriguing about uh, 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 Francois and, and Shen's uh, paper was that they, they brought in the ethics aspect from an evolutionary point
point of view and really the, the cultural evolution. And I think there is a, that is where we can really expand horizons for applied evolutionary biologists. And when we start integrating that in a systematic manner, we can get, go beyond imposing ourselves and our own ethics. We can actually start asking questions about how ethics arrive in certain environments, uh, arise in certain environments. And so this co-evolution between um, ethics and, and uh, rapid uh, biodiversity loss or rapid adaptation or what it might be. There's so much to discover there. Okay, thank you very much. So um, we have one question there in the room. Hi, I'm uh, Ophélie Rons from uh, ISEM Montpellier. Can you hear me? Uh, so I wanted to come back to um, one issue that I think we didn't discuss much. And I want to come back to um, two uh, points that were made in the previous discussion. One is that we are not in a crisis that will stop, but in a transition, and some of the changes are irreversible, uh, such as climate change. And the other um, fact that we agreed upon is that uh, most species, when confronted to such rapid changes, don't adapt to those changes and will go extinct. So there's also discussion in the literature about whether um, an evolutionary approach to conservation is just a limiting impact and letting spontaneous evolution occur, um, given that we know that it's not sufficient in many cases already. Um, there are people that are uh, supporting the view that we should actually use evolutionary knowledge to speed up evolution in many instances, uh, because we are uh, in this transition where a lot of species will go extinct, and as a conservation point of view, we should limit this extinction and um, drive evolution or help evolution beyond the natural or spontaneous rate of evolution of those populations. So I wanted to open the discussion about that because I thought that it's another aspect of how evolution might affect conservation biology that is um, has a lot of complicated ethical and philosophical uh, and also just uh, simply scientific implication that uh, maybe we could discuss. Okay, gr great comment. Does anyone want to jump on that? Ah, I knew you would, Francois. Yeah, I can try to, to give a few words about that, but um, um, I will probably not close, of course, the discussion about that, <laughs> that issue. I, I think this is a, a very important point, uh, which is... Um, when we want to, to start to, to conserve uh, and to try to, rest, to maintain some kind of naturalness and to try to, to reduce the level of extinction, uh, up to what level we are ready to, to act and to, to, in some way, give additional artificialization in, the <laughs> in, a, in a something which is already running. And, uh, and there is a lot of debate about that issue, particularly in the IUCN, for example, the, uh, among the specialist groups working, for example, on uh, conservation translocation, all the debate about uh, assisted colonization, assisted migration, should we move species just to help them to, to, to maintain, should we, I think, uh, hopefully you, <laughs> you work on that issues, uh, should we uh, uh, increase gene flow uh, between population to, to try to uh, cope with this matter of adaptation is, is um, is a big issue, and, and for practitioners, very not not scientists, but people who are uh, confronted to that issues in the field, uh, you, you you know, and we all know that this is a, a very tricky uh, question. But I would say that at least the fact that we try to to put that kind of uh, questions and agenda in this evolutionary framework may help to once again try to discriminate what is ends and what is means, what are ends and what are means. What do we want to? Uh, what are our main objectives? Do we want to uh, have things that will uh, follow the changes and the, the way we are driving the world, uh, driving or, or <laughs> more or less efficiently, but <laughs> the way we are impacting the world, or do we ultimately want to try to reduce that impact on on the on, on the things? And once we are agreeing or disagreeing on that on that issue, we can discuss about the means. What are we ready to do to that? And in some cases, you can perfectly admit that you want to uh, have the maximum of naturalness and, and uh, 
reduce our evolutionary impacts on other life forms, and in that aim, have to uh, increase gene flow, have to act on uh, some uh, translocation or to, to maintain population, or to, to have some particular action that will be extremely uh, um, invasive, I would say, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of impact. But you can uh, have that thing, uh, knowing that you want to, to just to contribute to a reduced uh, artificialization uh, later on. So, so I think you very often there are some, in this very uh, important question that you asked, uh, in, in many cases there is a confusion between ends and means. And I think that the paper by, by Emmanuel um, uh, and uh, Virginie and other colleagues uh, tries to, to, to cope with that gradient, and that was your very last figure that you, <laughs> you couldn't uh, show because of a matter of time, but uh, uh, you, 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 you try to cope with that gradient between uh, uh, the kind of ends that we are, the kind of ultimate objectives, and the kind of actions that we are ready to, to manage and uh, to, 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 to implement. And, and I think this is not necessarily directly linked. I mean, you, you can accept to act a lot in order to act far less later on and to, 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 to let uh, the maximum of uh, evolutionary freedom, I would say, to, to other life forms. Yep. Uh, yeah, and I was going to add that uh, maybe we, uh, maybe we, we, sh we, we don't need to wait until we ag agree uh, <laughs> in, uh, among us because uh, maybe we are not the ones that should decide, but we, we certainly can participate as citizens with our knowledge to this debate. But um, uh, again, it is, uh, uh, for me, it would be legitimate, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, identify means uh, as to, for example, whether we promote gene flow or, or not or so something else. For a scientist, as as long, okay, as long as you, uh, it's clear why, uh, in what you know perspective you are locating this this work, and other might not agree, but at least this is there's some transparency there, and uh, I guess with uh, you know with the different work that will be done, there will be some uh, you know agreement that will emerge at some point, I guess. Yeah, quickly, maybe. Uh, very quickly, and this is kind of to make a link between what Francois and Emmanuel just said and what Peter said earlier about imposing our ethics. Uh, could you, uh, Peter, just provide, uh, uh, for instance, an example? And is it linked to what Francois just said uh, regarding the ends? Like, uh, I just uh, I think it would be clearer perhaps for us that are not familiar with uh, this sure. idea of imposing ethics in this kind of evolutionary conservation context, whether it, it's linked with what Francois just said. Uh, well, it, it could be linked to in some means, but I think it it it, it it's a slightly parallel point about um, say that that scientific cultures also develop uh, as, uh, as was very nicely um, uh, illustrated in the final talk that, that we as scientists also develop cultures for some things that are good and they can often be, you know, that we, we develop a scientific norm that that's, that's uh, good. Um, of course, we as scientists are very bad at agreeing. So there's always some, usually always someone challenging it, but it, it can be, be difficult, but, but then, I think we, so the first step is understanding that we do have, we tend all to have ethics um, and apply that. So there are some things that we tend to think are good or should be done or should not be done. Um, but as, as again was pointed out, we, we have definitely a role in making decisions, a very important role, uh, but, but it has to be a, an inclusive uh, process. Um, with, with the people that are impacted um, on the ground, with, with other decision makers. Um, we all have ethics. Uh, there are also other <laughs> considerations rather than just ethics, of course. But, but so I, I don't think it's necessarily related to ends and means. It's just, 
making clear that even though there's something that is scientifically agreed upon, it may not necessarily be agreed upon by by non-scientists, but that doesn't make mean that it's wrong or should should not be done. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so f for uh, Tatiana, uh, I first I would like to ask you if you think you answered the question that I gave you at the end of your talk, which was uh, if the pressures were predictable, if you want to comment more on that, or if basically what you said, which is just that it's very complicated and messy, uh, is sort of it. I think some aspects may be predictable, some others not, and the answer definitely not, so yeah. Okay, case by case. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I wanted to ask you uh, if you think how much you think of that research that you showed and described is applicable to wild species because your results were in a special context. I mean, it's cultivated organisms. So how, how much of that is relevant um, to wild species if wild, I don't dare use the term anymore, but. Yeah, I think that uh, may be the same principle, but as we all said, that uh, if we lose diversity, then we lose evolutionary potential, uh, so wha whatever we call evolutionary potential, right. and then that's uh, uh, threatened the, the future um, uh, possibility of adaptation of species, and definitely, uh, so that links to a previous question of whether the, the selection is predictable, uh, definitely, I think uh, all what we're doing, habitat fragmentation, destruction of uh, habitats, and so on, uh, diminish uh, genetic variability and thus uh, evolutionary potential. So yeah, that's uh, the same issue overall. The difference, I think, is that on domesticated organisms, we can do something uh, because uh, we had the genetic variability uh, at that at that the emergence at the, when the domesticated organisms were initially domesticated and generated. And it's really the, the recent breeding system that is losing the diversity at a rapid pace. It's like the penicillium fungi. There, there were a huge diversity once. But then with the, the, the whole industrialization uh, and the, the movement between country, all, all uh, producers use the same strain, but they didn't use to do that. And it's the same thing in crops, and also, the, I think you mentioned GMOs, and the, the, it's also um, threatening in the same way. So uh, the GMOs, the, the, I think the main problem is maybe not eating them, it's that it generates a single line that is used everywhere and reduces diversity. And so that's uh, uh, really um, a strong issue, and, uh, that, and we can do something. Yeah, so agriculture, uh, promoted diversity for a yeah. long part of its history, and now it's exactly. eradicating it. Yeah, Francois. Yeah, and, and perhaps just to, to add on, uh, the, on the, the commentary by Tatiana, uh, I think one of the, also the paradox that uh, this uh, issue of uh, dom domesticated lines, um, genetic diversity, rises is uh, that, for example, if you, I don't want to, to open a debate about GMOs, but this is also the paradox that uh, for some colleagues working on that issues, there is this uh, dream of, of uh, driving this uh, evolution uh, uh, very accurately and expecting that they fix uh, any trouble uh, by just uh, moving one gene or one other. And, and you see that evolution is still running. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, so, so there is also a, some kind of uh, um, uh, of um, counter results, I would say, that, that, that shows that this is uh, uh, some kind of dream to, to expect to fix uh, uh, this uh, dynamics because of evolution, which is still running. And, and I will just finish on that comment by uh, adding that uh, uh, additionally to the, to, the, um, to the management of the, the evolution of uh, domesticated forms, these forms uh, interact with uh, wild forms in many places, perhaps a bit less for, for she's, but, but even for she's, probably with some bacteria and things like that. But, but at least for uh, uh, field uh, species that, that, that crops or, or, or even animals that are uh, bred in the field, uh, they, the way they are managed, the way they are uh, raised, 
interact with other life forms outside of that. So this is all the, the area of uh, agroecology and uh, uh, biodiversity conservation in agricultural landscapes. Uh, this is a big issue to see how there is some kind of extension of extend, uh, extent for, sorry, of, uh, of domestication <laughs> uh, outside of the of the, of the focus on, on the few domesticated species that, that are the raised there. Uh, can you give an example of that? So in the apple domestic in the domesticated apples, uh, so there is gene flow among apples with wild apples, and uh, also and then it also induces the gene flow of their pathogens, and so and there are uh, gene flow uh, from the domesticated apples to wild apples, and and the pathogen actually and actually their pathogen become pesticides, so they become more aggressive on the wild population that also incorporated genes that are not that efficient in the wild, and so threatening also wild population. And it is, I think, so this is about evolution and conservation, and I think we, we hear all, all the same idea that we should keep evolutionary potential, and how, and what exactly. But I think the danger that really this view is not shared widely even among scientists because sometimes about this uh, disease uh, in crops uh, sometimes you hear that uh, well you, we just created new genes and insert it uh, with the CRISPR and we solve every problem and no that's not how evolution uh, how evolution works and pathogens develop very rapidly and we we'll break up every gene we can generate so we really need the diversity uh, again, the, the pathogen, for instance. Mm. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I wanted to build on, uh, on, on, on this point about altering genes. And, and, but I think we can, we can also, as uh, evolutionary scientists, we have to go beyond saying uh, altering a single gene will not uh, fix things, because there can very easily be instances where altering one gene could could help um, address a short-term problem that actually was worth it for, for that community, maybe. Uh, maybe not. It often depends on the social context. But I think it's because we often talk about genes that have uh, direct selective uh, consequences, um, such as uh, uh, toxins or uh, other such things, uh, pathogen resistance genes or drug resistance genes, maybe. Um, Less so, but but if we think about uh, genes that produce, for example, a certain vitamin, and and adding that um, to a a crop that is grown like cassava or whatever it may be, uh, in in a mal in a community that, that suffers from malnutrition, that actually doesn't necessarily. Uh, have huge evolutionary consequences. I, I don't know any papers that shows that. Um, but the tricky part in the implementation all lies in the social uh, context, the soci socioeconomic context, who has, who has rights for the patent. Um, can, is there a diversity of, of the crop? Like, so you could actually do that, but maybe often it's easier for the company to have a, just a single strain. But but there's nothing preventing you from inserting a sort of a vitamin D gene or, or beta carotene gene in a diversity of strains. So, so I would encourage us to then again say, okay, what gene and when and in what context and over what timescales and what are the likely impacts? Um, because there's, uh, at least I have, uh, opened up my, my own ethics around that, uh, just looking at the, trying to look at the, the scientific evidence around it. Um, but again, there are important um, precautionary principles. And if the European population feels that the uncertainties or are either biological uncertainties or the socioeconomic uncertainties around what businesses may do or what they may not do, are big enough that they don't trust them, then of course it's the rightful decision of the European population to have a moratorium on, on GMOs. So that, that would be my point there. Interesting point. Okay, um, Emmanuel, I actually have a question for you. <laughs> um, so the question says, can you say more about the intrinsic values, not ut utilitarian values, intrinsic values, 
uh, of evolutionary potentials and if we can use them to decide conservation policies? Uh, okay, yes, this is a slide that I put in, uh, you know, uh, as a backup, uh, but uh, obviously did not have time to <laughs> present it. But uh, so uh, when we uh, attribute value to biodiversity, for example, uh, this value can be of different kinds. Uh, and Virginie Maris uh, will be here in two days. Uh, you know, she, she's more expert in me uh, than me in, in this question. But the intrinsic value is the end. We were talking about the end earlier. So what ultimately uh, we uh, value as deserving moral consideration, so to preserve while the uh, instrumental value is the mean. So how do we, uh, you know, what mean do we use? So what uh, we can value, for example, conservation of evolutionary potential, because it's a mean to achieve uh, um, a goal that is uh, that has intrinsic value, for example, conserving, uh, you know, uh, communities, uh, biodiversity, uh, adaptation, whatever. Uh, one uh, one problem, well, one question uh, when we look at the literature is there's a, you know, the separation between the two is sometimes blurred. So, and I think that what contributes to that, I'm not the only one, I'm not the first one to, to, to mention that kind of thing, but I think that this focus on, you know, techno, uh, technological advance, uh, not saying that we should not do evidence-based uh, or knowledge-based conservation. This, this is not what I say, but um, at some point, uh, it seems that some may value conservation of evolutionary potential for itself. And there's two ways uh, we identify. Uh, so you can you know, come to this point maybe not very consciously, but you could also, under the framework that we call non-anthropogenic uh, value uh, uh, of process, uh, we could want to, uh, to preserve the evolutionary process, and then in itself, evolutionary, ev evolutionary potential can be a, you know, the one of the end. These are two different things. One is more conscious, uh, and the other one is more maybe a, a drift from uh, that comes from you know research um, mainly in conservation genetics i would say i don't know if uh, that's it anyone else add something on that quickly uh, perhaps just um, sorry no. just uh, uh, to add uh, on on emmanuel's comments in fact indeed once again if we if we go back to the idea to to try to reduce our impact on on the evolutionary trajectories um, before anthropization, uh, there were populations with high evolutionary potential and a natural population with low evolutionary potential. Low evolutionary potential is part of evolution. <laughs> I mean, a counter-selected uh, organism uh, has, uh, by the end, uh, low evolutionary potential. So, so the idea of trying to maximize everywhere, uh, every time, uh, evolutionary potential is contradictory with the idea to try to reduce our impact on uh, evolutionary uh, trajectories. But if we want to restore that because we have uh, impacted that, sometimes we have to act again to try to restore evolution. Uh, interesting point. Uh, I think we have a question in the room. Yeah, yeah. or a comment? I, I don't know if you hear me. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Um, my name is Johan, and I'm not an expert of this question because I'm just a teacher who tries to spread the word for future citizens uh, about biodiversity, conservation, etc. But, I mean, we have talked about a lot of um, importance of poten uh, potential uh, of evolutionary um, places and areas, and I had the question uh, about politic and public um, politi um, public policies. If there are currently some discussions about creating some areas like hotspots, uh, like hotspots now, but for uh, evolutionary rescue, maybe for animals that will be flying away the spots actually where they are now, and they will be flying away, for example, from hotter temperatures. Uh, from ch climate change, and they will be they will go to higher altitudes. I don't know, and if there there are places, are there 
conservative now and are there discussions about that? Thank you. Yeah, we had other questions on hotspots. I mean, hotspots are an issue uh, uh, around, you know, for example, the idea about whether um, they're evolutionary hotspots or conservation hotspots. So does anyone want to react on this, Peter? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think in most cases what is being done is we, we take them into uh, care. Uh, so if you look at frogs, uh, for example, I don't have a, a, an exact number of how many frogs are now being bred, trying to be bred in, in captivity. But that would usually be the first step, even before doing some, at least if you ha have to do a bigger transfer case. If it's over a small scale, maybe it's not as big an issue. But the number of species that are being bred in captivity, because we're worried about their uh, lack of adaptive potential, for example, to the chytrid uh, fungus in, in frogs, are, are definitely increasing. So, so I would say that that's a big part of it. And just maintaining, as uh, I mean, uh, Jan also pointed out, maintaining the gene pool diversity requires very deliberate action, right? In very elaborate breeding programs in zoos. Um, and that's a very important function for some future event making. Um, but others may know more about what's happening in the wild. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, I, I agree with Peter. This is a huge issue. Uh, as, well, as I uh, already said, uh, to, to answer to Ophelia's uh, question, uh, about uh, conservation translocation, there, there is a lot of discussion about the way we should or should not uh, accept the arrival of, uh, of species coming from, uh, in response to, to global changes. There is a big uh, issue about the invasive species, and Frank could, could say uh, some more about that. Uh, and so discriminating what are the species that are moving, I would say, naturally in response to the, the pressure from species that we move ourselves and, and we, that we could prevent to, 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 to move is a, is a big debate uh, among uh, scientists and practitioners. And um, this is also an issue for restoration uh, because a lot of uh, restoration strategies are trying to cope with this matter of uh, global change and particularly climate change to say, should we restore things where they were, they used to be in their indigenous range, or should we try to restore them or to try to introduce them somewhere else? Uh, and once again, normally it is recommended that there should be um, feasibility and risk assessment for that. But we all know that risk assessments we were very crude and very difficult to, to cope with, particularly because prediction is, is not easy. And if we add this evolutionary dimension in that process, you can understand that uh, uh, predicting this risk is not easy at all, even feasibility. So, so this is a, a matter of complexity, but uh, this is an increasing issue. But it raises also the, the question of the link with this matter of adaptation. I think it will be discussed for the climate session. But once again, we see that the, 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 the meaning of the term adaptation is not totally the same when we discuss about climate and when you discuss about this matter of evolution. And we have to merge that to understand that reducing the pressure, this pressure is, is also a matter of adaptation. OK, so I think um, we should throw on the table a uh, last question here. Um, which is a question about politicians and stakeholders. And it points out that the time scale of evolution and of evolutionary potential uh, is completely dis disconnected with the time scale of the political agenda. Um, and of course, it's a problem that we all know. Um, any ideas on how we deal with that um, and how we can manage this gap? Provide Camembert and work for to Emmanuel Macron tonight. <laughs> well, one thing I can say is that we first have to educate, educate these politicians and stakeholders as to what is evolution. So we had this experience at the F FRB where we had a discussion, like we call it a club, um, inviting different stakeholders and, and different researchers to discuss uh, the link between biodiversity, uh, conservation, and evolution, so exactly the topic of today. Uh, and we realized that uh, most 
stakeholders came because they misinterpreted the term evolution. Uh, so our first job was to actually explain, and this is why I actually uh, entitled my talk today Darwinian Evolution, to make sure people understood that I was going to talk about really genetic evolution. So I think it's, it starts with educating people. So we have actually um, issued a text uh, that is um, oriented towards this goal of educating the greater public about uh, what is evolution and why does it matter when we talk about bio biodiversity. So I think this is the first answer because we will only convince to preserve uh, what people understand needs to be preserved. So, and, and I think actually the COVID crisis has kind, kind of helped us in this way that people have better knowledge of why evolution is important now because as someone mentioned, uh, we wouldn't be in the same situation if the virus hadn't evolved. So I think it helped in the sense that people are, are grabbing uh, fundamental notions of evolution better and politicians are understanding that it actually needs to be taken into account. So it's probably up to us now to uh, take this debate on COVID and place it where it needs to be placed elsewhere because evolution matters not only for epidemiology but all fields of biology. But it's interesting that you, you mean educating the public rather than educating the actual politicians and stakeholders. Yes, that's, that's I, what you started I with. really meant both. So the, the document that uh, we, we wrote at the FRB, who, which was just published uh, this week, um, I will probably tweet about it soon if you want <laughs> to spread it. It's in French, but it was initially because we realized the stakeholders didn't understand, and then we, uh, we kind of consider stakeholders as the um, greater public that, you know, non-knowledgeable about uh, our scientific perspective on things. Uh, yeah, go ahead and then Peter. Uh, okay. um, there was a paper a few years ago by uh, Rob Burtz and all that thing, uh, where they, uh, you know, address a little bit the temporal dimension and they, they say at some point that, you know, uh, even though uh, we are dealing with a process that can be viewed at different scale and, you know, uh, evolutionary uh, change, uh, you know, won't stop, you know, uh, because we, we can only predict for the next, uh, you know, couple of generation. Uh, they say that maybe uh, the uh, only um, way we can do something is to act at the scale, time scale of human, and uh, and this maybe uh, make a link with politician and uh, you know uh, people that de decision maker. But uh, I'm not. I don't know if uh, they are right or not when they say that. But uh, this uh, made me makes me think that uh, there were some example. I think in Peter's presentation where uh, when. You know, you look at the pattern at at a mega mega scale. Uh, there might be some leverage here to you know bring a decision maker and politician to integrate perhaps um, evolutionary uh, thinking uh, because uh, it, maybe it's uh, we see uh, for example uh, where uh, evolutionary processes are you know not natural anymore or to what degree they are natural so. I don't know if Peter agrees with not, or not with that, but uh, with that kind of thing, maybe there's leverage to bridge the two. Yeah. Um, Peter, briefly, because we're running out of time. Yes, uh, I'll do it very short. I, yeah, I think there, I mean, there's never been a bit, uh, bigger opportunity for uh, educating and creating awareness about evolution and its various roles. Um, and then the ethics discussion can wait for tomorrow. But yes, I mean, what is evolution good at? It's very good at exploiting resources, uh, including carbon. Uh, that's what we need to draw down in, in the soil. So connecting to the nature-based solutions narrative is a huge opportunity. Uh, protecting, you know, primary forests with huge stocks of carbon that are being, uh, you know, kept uh, recycled all the time is, is a big one. And and of course, COVID. I mean, it's it's uh, adamant. It's it's it is now that we have to do it. It's the biggest impact we, at least in the Western world, have had um, from evolutionary processes in a very long time. Uh, so, and if we 
give evolution some space in some places, well, there's a good chance it will, we will have less of, of that. So there's never been a bit, better chance for, for jumping on the wagon and actually educating about egocentric approaches or just evolution. Yeah, I think COVID has been a powerful science teacher. You want to conclude, François? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I think that... Just, just a few words to say that, of course, we have opened far more questions that we have answered, even if you are, there were a lot of information, I think, this afternoon. And thanks again for all uh, speakers to, to have uh, gave us uh, uh, very nice views about uh, all the uh, front uh, line uh, on science concerning this uh, possibility to include uh, conservation into this uh, broader uh, context of uh, evolution and not the contrary. Um, so I, I think this is uh, very important to, to keep going on this uh, kind of research. And, and once again, uh, not considering that only from the point of view of evolutionary biologists, <laughs> but from the point of view of uh, the whole range of science that uh, from uh, natural to, to social sciences that have to cope with this uh, evolutionary nature of uh, biodiversity and also including us as uh, living forms also. We, we have also our evolutionary uh, constraints and, uh, and roots, um, even if uh, cultural evolution, of course, is, is extremely important for us. So, so we have to, to, to keep going on, on putting evolutionary uh, discussions and, and uh, uh, acculturation in, in this agenda, I think, of uh, uh, conservation uh, uh, strategies, uh, and when we want to define conservation strategies, including also, of course, uh, all the public uh, arena and, and stakeholders, politi politics, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it's, it's very important. So thank, thank you so much for coming, and, and I think we had a very fruitful Discussion. Yeah, it was a really great session, very eye-opening. Thank Thanks very much for being there, and thank you to all the speakers for their work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we meet tomorrow morning. Thank you. Bye, thank you.